Our next panel are going to um, have a lot of experience in the courts and are going to share um, their experiences and some, some insights on the merging of restorative justice and the court system. Um, I'm going to introduce both speakers again, and they're going to speak from the podium. They both have PowerPoints. So I'm going to begin by Joseph Fliesaway. Um, Judge Fliesaway formerly served as chief judge of the Hulapai? How do you say that? Wallapai, sorry, tribal court. And he currently serves as pro tem judge for several tribal courts in the Southwest. In addition, he works as a community nation building consultant in Phoenix, Arizona. Judge Flies Away describes himself as a community and nation, oh, I said that, sorry, <laughs> my eyes. As a consultant, Fly Judge Flies Away facilitates tribal and community nation building and experiences, including serving as tribal council member, director of the tribe's Department of Planning Community Vision, chief judge, associate judge um, of the tribal court. He also holds a JD degree from the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law, a master's degree in public administration from Harvard's Kennedy School of Education Government, and is a graduate of Stanford University in English. Um, and Ron Whitener, who um, arrived late last night, we were happy to have him come as well. Um, Ron is an affiliate professor of law at the University of Washington Law School. He graduated from the, with a Bachelor of Arts from Evergreen State College and a JD from the University of Washington. He has is, he is a lot of experience both in terms of Alaskan uh, tribal courts and things that are going tribal courts in the state of Washington. His legal interests are jurisdictional and ethical issues in the courts of American Indian and Alaskan Native tribal courts, as well as legal, ethical, and societal implications of research among American Indian and Alaska Native communities. So would you welcome both of them, and I'll have uh, Judge Flies Away come up. Joe, I'm. they call me Joey, so I'm sometimes used to be called Joey at home. I'm going to be talking about this, and I'm going to go through how this is built. And there's not a lot of time, because this, there's a lot to just, when I taught law students, I would use this as well. And when I do teachings and trainings, I will use this all the time uh, to get things out. And I, I'm on an attention deficit situation today, so bear with me if I get lost. But that's why I always have PowerPoint. This is, you already saw the little one, but this is what I'm going to talk about. And what I want to emphasize is how it's built and the axes and the, the poles and the names of all the differences that it's, it's something that you will all have some relationship to or you will have a sense of, I'm sure, both as a human being, as a member of a family, a member of a, a city, a member of a school, a member of a tribe, a member of a nation, or just a human being on the planet. So you, you should feel or sense some relationship with this. So the first thing is law. What do we talk? We've been talking about justice and restorative justice, but but what is law? And you, you go to law school and they'll tell you what law is, or they say we're reading the law, the, the judge, judge made law, the statutes. So we figure out what the law is. So in the the sphere is majorly majority major, majorly made up of an axis, and this is this this axis. And on one end is custom, common practice, and culture. Custom, common practice, and culture. What, what we do, or who we are. And the other end, constitution, common law, and codes, that which we write. So law for all human beings, for people, is between who they are and what they do, what they've been doing, and then what has over time come to what is written. So in law school, you're going to be going through a lot of the, the law. We start reading, what, cases right off the bat. We, Johnson v. McIntosh, you know, that was when we get right off the bat. Discovery. Judges write codes, and we take ours from the common law system in England. So we have a lot of words. But tribal people, we were telling stories. You've heard about that already. Stories, and there are petroglyphs. And the whole petroglyphs will tell this whole story about creation where we come from or where we're supposed to go. I told someone I'm in an emotional situation, uh, so bear with it. 
So you have the axis of, of law, and the, the sphere is made of it. It becomes the sphere whole, and we call that D. We'll call that dream. The next one, and there is an argument that I've been making to myself, because when I created this, I, want, I call it the spirituality of law. So the majority of the axes is this first one. And then there are three others. So then I, I, I will tell people, maybe you want to come from one of the other axes. So as we go through them, make your own argument. No, I think it's more of these. And then the really, I guess, correct answer, even for my own talking, is that there should be equal amounts of each one. So, but you'll see what I'm talking about. The other one has cooperation at one end and conflict at the other. We're going to go throughout life with having problems and issues. We're going to have all these problems and things that we're going to face as a person, as a people, as a group. But at the same time, there's a cooperation in the world. It's there. Maybe in, in life right now, for me anyway, it's down here. So we go through it all the time. But we have the cooperation, and we can move towards it. We call that reason. And L, which is lightning. Next one, on one side, conscious. What one thinks is right or wrong. On the other, the collective conscious. What a group thinks is right or wrong. So we go throughout our life always feeling, well, I know what's right. I could do this. I'm this way. I'm that way. But then you have your family. You have your parents. You have your school friends. You have your, your school. You have the church. You have all of these things that tell you and who you are as right or wrong. And that where are you on that? We, we go from this side, and then we go this side. But that's all a power, part of morality, what, is, what people think is right and good. And we come from all these different ways of that. The whole world. I mean, you would say Afghanistan. They're not letting the women go to, to school. And that's how they think. And, and I think that's crazy. But in some of their, in their thinking, they, they, that's their morality. That's their way of being. So, but we all around the world have different ways of thinking what is right or wrong. We call that R. Rain. We've been hearing about water. Water, rain, moisture, as we talked about earlier, is, is important. We are water. 70% of our bodies we are molecules of H2O. We should always think and know that. The last one, the, the axes, on one side we have the group, the government, the community. Call it will. And then you have the individual. Personal rights, first rights, group rights. You have the liberals and you have the, de you have the Democrats and you have the conservatives and the, 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 the other, the conservatives and... I mean, the word is, but we're all there, right? <laughs> we're all on that line, and some people want to be conservative, so they're over here closer to the citizen side. They're like the state rights side, and over here is governments, you know, the federal government side. But nowhere in this sphere is wrong, and I always say it that loud so people can remember. <laughs> it's just maybe on the farthest out dot is probably the person you never want to meet, maybe because they're so way over there that you're not going to like that. Right? So, but nowhere is out of creation. This is all in creation. It's all part of God. I'm gonna, I better get my Catholic hat on so I can talk in the right way. I used to be Mormon, so I have a different variation. My mom's a Baptist wife to a preacher. You know, so my brother's still Mormon. So, so we, we, you know, religion is one thing. And we call that E, Earth. Earth, lightning, dream, and rain. Warrior of law. And as I think Justice said, everyone, everybody is a warrior of law. A warrior of law could be a nation builder. It could be a court, the whole court system. It could be the one peacemaker. They're warriors of law. What they do is they bring you together to confront the issue, acknowledge the problem, the alcoholics say, I'm an alcoholic. They, they, they say it out loud, they grab at it, and they show you, or they tell you, this is what it is. So you come together, talk in circles, whatever groups, you have an indictment or whatever, you go to court, you get guilty, not guilty, you confront it, that, that part of confrontation, that's the first part of, of fixing something. However you do it, in whatever way that you communicate, 
communicate would be the legal process, communicate would be the talking, communicate would be how you're going to go about in ceremony to try to fix something, to how to fix your problems. How do you get to restoring the, what was before? But in some cases, there wasn't a before. You just were always apart. So we're trying to find how you can fit together. You make compromises. You have to give up things. A person's going to have to give up being naughty, doing all these bad things, and you know, giving up whatever, giving up alcohol, giving up the things that make them awful, giving up whatever it's going to be. You have to make compromises, everybody, in order to get to concord, accord, or peace. So how everybody does it, if a court would do it a certain way, a legal process, it, a tribe might have a ceremony, you go and do it. Someone can create their own means of seeking accord and, and concord and peace. But you can't get it all done without thinking of what was back here. And then you are here. But we always don't always think about the natives have the seventh generation. What is over there? And in all the talking and in all the communication to the defendant or the family or the juvenile or whoever it's going to be, how are you going to move over there? The judicial system might be real tight about, okay, you guys do that social worker, you go over there, probation officer, do, it. do your little pot, parts and we'll come together, the judge might write an order, but maybe another court, wellness court, will do it together in a team, as a group, collectively, or as a family. But you have the past, the present, and the possible in the future, all a part of the sphere. People and leadership, we heard a little bit about that. This is a whole other, what I've talked to students about, government, communication building, and so I can't go through the whole thing. The people policy place and pecuniary possibilities really means the people gather, gather, ground, and grow. The people gather, ground, and grow. That's community and nation building. And so the war of law, would say, I stand in reason, I walk with will, I stumble over morality, but I catch myself and go on in my journey with law. So, earth, lightning, dream, and rain. Earth, the physical, like the actus reus, we're thinking about criminal law, the act, something happens. Lightning, the intellectual, the mens rea, you have to have the bad head, the bad thinking, you have to know that you did something bad or just we come to court and they'll try to prove you had that bad thought, or whatever, however you're going to think about it. So the law students probably should think, oh, okay. <laughs> but then you have the rain, the emotional, the wet, the floods. And there is this therapeutic jurisprudence. Do they teach that here? Yeah, therapeutic jurisprudence. Because you have, they would take the actus reus, but then they'll start thinking about the psychological and emotional well-being of people. Then it, Winnick and Wexler people. The um, first time I talked about this was at the Therapeutic Jurisprudence Conference and way a long time ago. But I, that's TJ. But then now you have them who brought in that, them who brought in that. You, you have the old way, act, the mind. They brought in the stuff. And then here, the dream, the spiritual, the spiritus, the divine breath. That which connects and puts us all together. Catholics would say the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the voice of Creator, the voice of God. But full law, full restoration would be ELDR, all of this together, and how you move forward, what you need to do, bringing in all of these elements. So the plus, spirituality, it means the relatedness and connectedness human beings share with all creation. We all have our own way of thinking. We have a Catholic thought. We have a Mormon thought. We have a Baptist thought. We'll have our Ojibwe and Nishinaabic kind of ways of thinking, the Diné, you know, all of these different ways of how we are. We have our, our, our thought of how we're connected and related. And it's, but it's law. It's, that's the concept of being law. It defines relationships and connections. The what is written, as I said, and what is done. But it doesn't mean the church exactly, because if somebody has that as their own, and they will share that with all those people. But it's not Catholic. It's not Mormon. 
it, I guess of all of them, be more Buddhist, you know, that kind of thinking. <laughs> but, it, but it's, we don't, this isn't religion. Everyone has their religion, and that's fine. They should have that religion. But this is about their person, the person, that's how they think they're connected, and a lot of other people are as well. So healing, addressing trauma, because that is for Native people all over this country, and, and not just for Natives. I mean, we're, I was talking with other people. There's a whole bunch of people all over the world that are in trauma, and they have legacies of trauma. They have a whole bunch of things that have happened to us. There's probably no human descendant in here that's got, come from a group of people that were knocked around and pushed away and shoved and killed and, and hurt. You know, I sometimes, you know, cringe when I hear all of the, the brown people say, it's us only, or it, that's how it's sometimes felt. But the white people too, they have their own trauma from all their history. We all share trauma down in our roots. And some of us just happen to be so close to it, just right here. Some of yours is further up. But it's there, and it might have trickled down to what you do, who you are, and how you act. And we all have to deal with it somehow. How do we get rid of and deal with and address trauma? Well, we reconnect to something positive, And we talked about connection. How do you bring ties? How do you bring people back together to something that was before, to something that wasn't there yet? Because it just hadn't grown. You lose the disconnections, those things that are bad for everybody, those things that hurt people. But, it, but how do you do that? Your ceremony. You have all these different things of doing, how you might do that. So to heal, we must seek and pursue, strive and search for, and this is the wallopi term that I like to use. I, I was searching for a word, you know, my Catholic, I almost wanted to be a priest, so I went to a Catholic school, and I paid for it myself working at Safeway. It was like paying for a college, but I paid for it myself. My mom was Mormon at the time. She, I'm not going to pay for that. <laughs> now she's Baptist, so she definitely want to pay for that. They don't even like to dance, those people. I, I don't get that. Honk, why are you? So I asked a friend, uh, my distant relative, uh, Sharon, at work one time, and said, Sharon, how do you say peace be with you? You can't say that. And I kept saying, how do you say it? And I kept for three months about, for a long time, because I said, just think of the words. What, how would you come with? Because Native people, the ones who know their language, know it's not word for word. Uh, like in Wallapa, it's what, that's what they say. How do you say what time it is? Yeah, son. It can also mean I. Where is like up? And how are you in relationship? It's not K ora S. What hour is it? It's and then you got the son, and then you going into that whole conversation about what time. So, I, so finally she said, okay, what about Hank Waioyu? And I said to her, so what does it mean? And she goes, Joey, because I went through this whole thing of and her thinking, no, what do the, what the words mean? Hank, why are you? Hank, good. Han, Han, good. Wa, house or living place. Why are you living? Hank is well, but living together. Hank, why are you? Living together well. So my way in Wallapai to say peace be with you is Hank, why are you? So to all the Catholics, Han Kwayoyu. <laughs> Thank you. Because no one ever did that. I, did, I spent years writing on my Twitter, Han Kwayoyu, or peace for you. Not one Catholic or anybody <laughs> said that also with you. So I had to write back to myself. <laughs> and then they go and change it. And also with your spirit. I, I, I don't do that. <laughs> I say, and also with you. I'm Francis, me, not really, but I mean, I... I'm going to stay with, and also with you. Okay, I, I, I diverse, or, or whatever. So, honk, why owe you? Is peace be with you? It's, that's how we we'll say it, and that's what we try to get to. And Zawinema, who knows what that is? Dawinema. Oh, there's nobody. Okay, this is good because she mentioned the lady before. Um, Milax Band, I believe, The Healing Journey. They have a wellness court, a family wellness court. They have a code. They, they were one of the first tribes who wrote a whole code for their wellness court, family wellness court. 
And it's based in the concept Zawinima. And it means keep the people together as one. So I'm, I'm helping with an evaluation of that. And so I'm thinking, how do we evaluate that? And I think that's a kind of really cool question. So talking with them, what things, what data do we need to gather, do you need to gather over ter term of time to kind of say, yes. So there's like, it's, it's a family wellness, I mean, it's a uh, dependency-based kind of court. So it's reunifications, placement time, um, how many placements before it, they got home or... Re, uh, just reconnecting with the mother, father. So, but this is the first time I've ever seen a whole wellness court in code, and it is based in that concept. And this is what they're thriving for, this group of people. And others, we've heard other words today, the same kind of thing. These are what we're thriving for. So we're thriving for concord, accord, and peace. Now, Restorative justice. Repair, bring back, men fix. I write these things called sillimeters, and so every time I try to think of something, I try to put it into a, it's a, it's a, poem, a poem, I guess you poetry structure, like uh, the Japanese one, haiku, you know, five, seven, five. Um, but, but this is it's the same number of syllables and then I like to rhyme. It's hard for me not to rhyme. I could have been a good rapper, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I, I can be at 80 or something. So restorative justice, repair, bring back, men fix. Renovate, cure, replace, wholeness, balance, just brace. Earth, lightning, dream and rain. Spirit, full, law, ties, train. And the words all mean, I, I look up these words. Because, you know, rhyme, you have to get a really good word, but you want to get a word that works, right? It's not, and it's not the choo-choo. Look up that word, and you'll see which one I'm talking about. Con cap centered, middle, graced ground, conquered, awkward, peace found. The, the warrior of law, all of us, well, I don't know. I would say that the warrior of law, who they want to do their job, should come from the center of the sphere for the most part. Because you, you, you have to bring everybody together, balance, balance, harmony, restoration. Truth, speak, integrity, honest, transparency. Authentic, give and take, account for, actions, make. That's the, one of the harder ones to thinking. I was telling a judge here that this was a, a planning tool because I was planning for my tribe and we were developing things. We, we, we developed a, a corporation that then later developed the, the Skywalk. So if you ever heard of the Skywalk at Wallapai, that's, that's where I'm from. We had half a million people there one year, a few years ago. And we had a lot of Chinese people and we were really hit hard with COVID. And a lot of people died. But it was because we were tourism. We brought it, we brought it, we brought it back. But I was, I mean, we brought it here, or there. But I was in a court one time, and I had my planning tool, and one of the juveniles said, Joey, what do you think about when you sentence me? And I let, like I said, the juveniles always call me Joey in court, but not the old, older ones. Judge, your honor. And I always used to hit my thing down real hard, and the whole room jump, they'll get scared. They'll, they'll go like this even before I do it after a while. But they, I said, well, gosh, that's a good question. So I began thinking, and all of those parts of the sphere started coming up. Yes, I had to think about there's what's written and, and all of this, but in sentencing, what if people right or wrong, the group, the community, the school, the, you're all on the scene, and all the things I had to really think about. And so he forced me. And there's this book coming out from the ABA, published from the American Bar Association, and it's called Inf Trauma Informed Law. And it's going to be out in the next six months to a year. And I have a piece in there and a whole bunch of lawyers and some judges are writing on what that means. So, but I was, I had, I, this came from a very brave young Wallapai kid. Joey, well, what do you think about when you sentence me? And I said, no, we make dispositions. It's not sentencing for you. So, working, I, I had to figure out, I wanted to make sure he understood what I thought about and why I was saying, you need to go do this, you need to go do that. 
And there was an older, elder lady that I would say, you're going to go have to talk to Beth. I want to talk to Beth, you know, because she'll just keep talking to you and get after you and everything. Um, so he, he, how you have people think about what they're going to do and how they're going to account for it, all these things have to be thought about, and he helped me figure out what, what I did. Peacefulness, healing course, ceremony, soul source. And so it's soul, but you know, who's a contract? Contract law, soul source, you know what that is. But source, this kind, not just the source of something, but you're going to fly, soul source. And the ceremony, the ceremony of things is important. The ceremony of how you talk about things, how you feel the forgiveness or try to feel forgiveness to give and to feel your, from how you do that in a sweat talk, in a talking circle, in a court when you, it's during sentencing, when the victims address the defendant, all of those things are ceremony. And so, of course, if judges, you know, when they think that way, they're doing a lot of good for the, for the restoration portion if they're even just in their heads, though they're not, everybody's not thinking the way their thoughts are being strong. They're helping because it's a ceremony in court. Judge Vicente uh, said we must follow ourselves, we must allow ourselves to see justice in terms of healing, as was the axiom of our grandfathers. So we come from a people that we know, we know how to heal. We, we, we have it in our body. We have it in our blood. We, we have it in our minds and hearts. And so for, when I talk to people, that's what I hope we do. I have a big healing I need to go through at home and with my own mother and my own brother. So I, I hope you send me home with some good thoughts about that so I can uh, deal with that. Han Kwayo you. One last thing, Miss Andrew, Mrs. Andrew, I'm leaving this here, and this is going to be in your custody, and then you then decide where it shall end up thereafter. So this is going to be for you. Well, one of the problems with letting your elders go first is they usually really <laughs> burn it down. Uh, so prepare to be underwhelmed. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for uh, asking me uh, to come. My name is Ron Whitener. I'm a member of the Squaxin Island tribe, which is a small tribe located in southern Puget Sound. We're a saltwater Indian tribe. Uh, I grew up fishing and hunting and gathering in my community. Um, and I uh, decided to leave uh, and go not too far, just north to Seattle, uh, and go to law school. And I've, and I've got uh, Judge Flies Away uh, talked about uh, ADD and ADHD, which I, I definitely have, according to my niece uh, who works with me. Um, and my career has kind of shown that. I can't really sit still very much. So I was my tribe's. I thought I was going to be a fisheries biologist, found out that chemistry is really hard, uh, <laughs> decided to switch to law, uh, went back and was my tribe's first in-house attorney, practiced treaty law, uh, defending our treaties in, uh, in Washington state. Um, then I went into legal services uh, and into Seattle and represented natives in federal, state, and tribal court, and then got lured over to academia and created a clinic at the University of Washington Law School, uh, which is the Tribal Court Public Defense Clinic. It's still there. Uh, we represented uh, natives in predominantly the Tulalip Tribal Court, but also Port Gamble, Sklalem, Squaxin Islands, Skokomish, 
um, and uh, Saxuiaro. Uh, and I taught there for 14 years. That's the longest I ever stayed. Um, but because I could run around, go to court, I was in court all the time because I was a clinical professor. Um, it dealt with my antsiness. Um, while I was there, of course, I had to put on another hat. I took on the, the role of the chief judge for the Chehalis tribe. Uh, and there I worked uh, on the other side of the bench. I'd been an advocate all this time. Um, and I discovered how hard it was <laughs> to be the one that actually made the decisions. It's easy to make the argument. Uh, you can make your arguments, but somebody else makes the decision. That's the judge. And then I had to start making those decisions. And then uh, Tulalip came knocking, uh, said, you've been working here for 14 years. Um, we want you to join the bench. So I jumped to the bench. Uh, and I was the judge for a year. Just I wanted to be the lowly associate judge. I could write my opinions, do my cases. Uh, then Chief Judge Pauly decided to go into academia herself. And then I ended up being the chief judge uh, to Layla. Um, and so I was there for six years. I, I retired from there uh, in 2014. Um, I started there in 2014 and retired in 2020, just before the pandemic, actually. I issued my a resignation. I did not know the pandemic was coming. I didn't have forewarning. Uh, but it just worked out that way. But since then, uh, what I've been doing a lot is uh, working with tribal courts around the country, um, taking my jack-of-all-trades experience, expert in none, uh, and going and working with tribes um, on their justice systems. And it led me to doing a lot of work in Alaska. And that's what I'm going to focus on today is Alaska, because we're at sort of a crux time for Alaska uh, in this country. Uh, and I want people to understand that. Um, so I always have to start with history. I'm only starting in 741. People usually tease me that I start in the Crusades. Uh, but uh, Russia colonized uh, Alaska, essentially, in 1741, which is re really, for a lot of tribes, um, the Alaska here in the United States, everything hit them sort of last in a lot of ways. Uh, we, the United States, took over the discovery doctrine rights that Russia held. I only have like 20 minutes. I'm not going to go down my rabbit hole of exclaiming. I'm hoping everybody knows what the discovery doctrine is. Um, but we took, with this check, uh, the discovery doctrines that Alaska took from the Alaska natives when, they, when that Christian country discovered the non-Christian lands of what is now Alaska. 1958, we have statehood. Let's go back on the date. 1867, this was only 13 years before Marquette was founded in the 1880s, so fairly recently. This is a full 12 years after my tribe's treaty, which is one of the last treaties uh, that the United States uh, did. Statehood only occurred until 1958. And following statehood came the claims. So because Alaska was taken over by the United States, uh, when I said it took its discovery doctrine uh, rights from Russia, what that meant was the United States now had the responsibility to extinguish those claims if it wanted to be able to use the land legally. Uh, it didn't, of course. Never starts with them doing it legally first. So this is the, one of the triggers. This was the mining operation that went into lands that Alaska natives considered theirs. They filed land claims against the United States saying it was a takings. You're taking our aboriginal title under the Discovery Doctrine, and you haven't compensated us. There's no treaty. There's nothing. And so all of the attorneys in Washington, D.C. said, oh, yeah, that's true. That entire giant state, bigger, the biggest state in the country, none of those claims have been extinguished. So we have a huge problem. And so they solved it the way, in the 70s, Congress saw things. It wasn't through a treaty, it was through federal legislation, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, which took all of these little blocks of land out of federal ownership and did not give them to the tribes, gave them to corporations. So Alaska has a very different system than us. You have the tribes, then you have big regional corporations that took the land that settled the claims. They have shareholders. Those corporations do businesses, varied, could be forestry, could, they could own 8A corporations all over the country um, to generate money for their shareholders. But the tie between the corporations and the tribes is fraying. I'm a shareholder in Sea Alaska because I descend from Metlakatla Indian community as well. I'm not enrolled as any Alaska native, but I'm a shareholder in Sea Alaska. So this, this, it created this, it's sort of a, a system to where these corporations held a lot of control and a lot of power, and the tribes, really, they weren't even sure what they were. And the states certainly didn't know what they were. 
The state's position was that they were not federally recognized, and this was actually an issue that was up there. And the state resisted them and continues to resist them strongly. I take this uh, example of how strongly the state uh, fights against the tribes in Alaska. During the pandemic, the organized village of Cake, which is in Southwest, very small tribe, you can only reach it by plane or by boat. Um, they were having trouble with food because everything got shut down, so the planes weren't flying, the barges weren't coming in, they were literally running out of food. So they petitioned the United States under subsistence, federal subsistence laws, to be able to take one moose off federal lands to help feed the village. The state of Alaska took that all the way to the United States Supreme Court. The one moose. They're just any, it has been the history of, of fighting any advancement uh, by the tribes. And we see that through the uh, case law. Um, and I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna do my law professor thing and go in depth on these cases. Uh, but just to show, so in 1988, uh, we've got uh, Alaska State Supreme Court cases, which states again that one of the villages they're not sovereign. So the position of the state of Alaska was that the tribes in Alaska were not sovereign. They were different than the tribes in the lower 48 because of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. Um, now, this goes in, went in violation of federal law because there had been federal cases that have treat, had treated tribes as sovereign in the United States, but the state Supreme Court in Alaska wouldn't recognize those. Uh, we see in 1992 uh, that, again, the Alaska Supreme Court even though there were federal cases involving other specific villages in Alaska, we still see the Alaska Supreme Court stating that Congress intended that most Alaska Native groups not be treated as sovereigns. So again, a push by the state to not allow those tribes to be recognized as sovereigns. Uh, Alaska versus Native Village of Venati. Um, Indian country. This is if you're a do Indian law, you're going to read Venati. Uh, this is the case where one of the tribes that had a very large reservation, uh, the Venati village uh, reservation, was converted into uh, fee land. They were one of the few tribes that were able to keep their lands from going into the corporation. They pulled it out, and now this village owns a very large plot of land in Alaska in fee status because they wouldn't let it go into a village. They argued it was Indian country and so that they could have the same regulatory power. The United States Supreme Court said, no, it's not Indian country. But it still made, it cl made clear that they still recognized that the village was a sovereign, federally recognized tribe. John V. Baker, finally, the Alaska Supreme Court makes the spin and does find, OK, tribes are sovereign and uh, have the ability to regulate their own internal affairs. Uh, we see the state resisting after Baker. Uh, the Attorney General had issued an opinion that said we, the state government, still don't recognize Alaska villages as sovereign. And then the State Office of Children's Services used that opinion to quit allowing the tribes to have any access to any of their children's information in the state system. So they had to sue again into the state of Alaska, went up to the Supreme Court of the state of Alaska, and again they reiterated that we, are, we now find that they are sovereign, finally. This last year, note the date, July 2022, the state of Alaska finally recognized officially that the tribes in Alaska are sovereign. Even though they've been federally recognized, they've been on the list in 1993. Um, it has been such a war up there uh, for Alaska tribes to be able to regulate themselves with none of the, with, not, with few of the tools that we have in the lower 48. But that is changing um, because they're, uh, they're struggling with the, the same issues that we're struggling down here and their disparities and violence, but even worse, because Alaska's violent. Whether you're native or not, Alaska's violent. 48 out of 100 uh, women in Alaska, not native women, women, have experienced intimate partner violence in their lifetime. 41 out of 100 have experienced sexual violence. 62 out of 100 Alaska native women experienced intimate partner violence. And a big part of it is because they're so remote. These villages, I've, I've visited probably 50 villages in Alaska. Most of the time, I have to take a single prop plane and land on a dirt uh, strip um, if weather allows. I've been stuck a few places. Uh, this, this does not bother me. People were saying, well, you know, snow, you might get stuck here for a day. It's like I've been stuck in the middle of Bering Sea on a little island <laughs> waiting for a weather path between there and Bethel for like four days. If you start going a little stir crazy, um, so, you know, these are very remote places. Most of them don't have law enforcement. Uh, 
The United States, because of the fact that uh, Alaska is full PL280, they have, there's no federal law enforcement for Alaska Native villages. There's no BIA uh, officers. There's no BIA trained tribal officers. Um, it's just not available. And so it's a lot easier to get away with violence in Alaska than it would be other places in our country. VAWA is trying to address it. I'm not going to go through this, all of this. Uh, this is for your purposes if you want to look at this for some reason. But the Violence Against Women Act is really the place that we see more and more trying to provide more uh, justice in Alaska through it. And not just for Alaska, but for the rest of us. So VAWA, 94, it passes. Then we start seeing the tribal law provisions uh, coming into place. Then 2013, the big one. Uh, where the United States recognized the tribe's ability to prosecute non-Indians who commit domestic violence, um, as long as the, if the situation fits the uh, circumstance, which I, I have here, and also the tribe provides uh, protections in terms of uh, indigent public defense and a constitutionally uh, st a standard for judges, uh, and um, codes have to be available, and all of these things, this list of things that if you can meet that, then you can prosecute a non-Indian uh, for Alaska. When this was done in 2013, Senator Murkowski slid in a provision, though, that said that the VAWA does not apply to the Alaska Native tribes. She learned her lesson very quickly uh, because they got very angry. And in, in the state of Alaska, um, it's hard to get... Uh, elected uh, statewide if you can't swing the Alaska Native vote because they still are very, they're the highest percentage Native of any of our states. 2014, Congress repealed Section 910. So it only lasted about a year. And then 2022. So this is the biggest thing for Alaska because one, it, it, big thing for us because it added the blanks of assault uh, to tribal justice personnel, child violence, uh, obstruction of justice, sex trafficking and stalking. It took away that requirement that the, the violence has to be intimate partner violence for the tribe to have jurisdiction. So for instance, at Tulalip, we would have trouble because often we would have somebody, who would, a non-Indian, who commit domestic violence uh, against their intimate partner in front of their children or against their children. But it would not make good sense for Tulalip to go forward just prosecuting the perpetrator for the violence against the intimate partner, but not against the violence for the children. So we would push that to the state so that one jurisdiction would be prosecuting all of those. That was a big problem with VAWA 2013. That got fixed in VAWA 2022. But it created the Alaska pilot. And so one of the things that it did that is amazing to me is that if we go back to Venati, it creates a new version of Indian country in Alaska. It takes the Anksa villages because it sets out these areas designated as Alaska villages in the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. And what it does, it says, while that may not be reservation, we Congress recognize that you, the tribe, have the ability to uh, exercise full criminal and civil jurisdiction over all Indians present in that village boundary. All of a sudden, we now have something that never had in Alaska, except for Matlakatla, we had some boundary, a geographic area that you could exercise geographic jurisdiction in. Uh, and that is huge because now that, that settles a lot of the questions because you would be a village in Alaska, except for Metlakatla, there are no reservations. So they are often in a city municipality, which really is the Anks of village. But who are they gonna prosecute? Can they prosecute? They don't have a territory that is, was the same. This clears that up. Which is, which is huge. It also allows them, makes it clear that they have full jurisdiction to issue and enforce protective orders involving any person in matters that arises in the village, non-Indian or Indian, uh, or otherwise within the authority of the tribe. Uh, and it also makes clear that they can uh, full civil jurisdiction to enforce civil contempt, exclusion, and other appropriate mechanisms. But again, for criminal prosecution, they have to have the protections of the 2013 VAWA. Now, are they ready? No, they're not, uh, unfortunately. Like I said, we've, I've, I've uh, worked on needs assessments and with 50 different villages. Because of the history of it and no money flowing into the, those, they don't have courts that are the same as the courts down here. We have most tribes, um, I don't know about most tribes, most tribes have, have a criminal court of some sort. It's operated under the Indian Civil Rights Act. We have our own law enforcement to some certain degree. 
Um, they unfortunately don't have any of the funding to be able to do any of that. Uh, and so if there is any of it, the only place that I found is Metlakatla, which is different because they have a reservation, so they do have tribally funded uh, or federally funded law enforcement. Uh, I found one other, Chickaloon Village, which I love, uh, outside of Anchorage about an hour and a half, two hours. Um, they have their own police officer, and I don't know how they got it. They're very proud of it. They don't have any, it's unclear. The state's sorry that they uh, recognized it. They've tried to pull it, the peace officer status away from Chickaloon, um, but they've been able to do it. Um, the justice in Alaska is still very traditional. So because, it, it, you know, it's one of those things to where if you look at my tribe, my tribe's criminal system looks pretty Western because the Indian Civil Rights Act requires it. I have to have a jury. Uh, I have all the due process requirements under the Constitution, basically under the Indian Civil Rights, which results in the court, the main court, looking usually very Western. Now, we divert out anytime we can into something more traditional, but the United States has forced us into this more Western model. With economic development, we also see on the civil side a lot of the Western models being adopted because we want non-Indians to be comfortable to come in and do business and have their, their disputes arising off the reservation to be able to be adjudicated in the tribal court. In Alaska, they haven't had to deal with any of that much. Few, but not many. So their systems are very, very traditional. This is Port Graham, Alaska, a beautiful part of Alaska in the southeast. Um, and their council still is their court. And you'll find this in Alaska a lot. The council is the court because that is the only place that's in their, in their, their community that has the ability to solve disputes. And so the council wears many hats, not just the elected official, but also the adjudicatory form. And with it, the, chief, the, the, the first chief of the uh, Port Graham uh, native village is the adjudicator. The second chief is the investigator. If somebody says something's happening that violates the laws of the village, the second chief investigates. Then if it goes, needs to go forward, almost through a probable cause kind of determination, they don't call it probable cause, then it will go to the first chief um, to try to adjudicate it. If they can't come to an agreement, it will go to the full council, and the full council will decide whatever's going to settle the matter. Um, very, and, and this is a very common model in Alaska. A lot of tribal councils acting as the courts. Other thing that's also really common, it is much more uncommon in Alaska to find a single judge sitting on a case. They don't believe in that uh, for the most part. Um, they believe that the best, best decision is going to be made by elders, usually, and more than one person. So it's almost always a panel of two or a panel of three who hear the cases and decide what's going to happen to make the adjudication. Uh, and so one person courts is, is very unusual. Uh, we see a lot of circles, a lot of peacemaking circles. It's similar to the, the clans in Southeast Alaska use a lot of those types of models for their traditional justice. Uh, and we're seeing the tribal courts incorporating that uh, into their courts. Um, so circle uh, peacemaking is very, very uh, prominent in Alaska. There's a few tribes that have single court judges. Um, single judge courts. Uh, this is Central Council of Clinton and Haida in Juneau. Uh, they have um, uh, single judge here matters, uh, but it is very much the um, exception to the rule. And then law enforcement, the other issue that's uh, facing Alaska. Uh, this is Annette Island, again, the only reservation in Alaska that remains, so they get funding and they have a police department. Um, it's not, but they're not really practicing criminal. When you look at their code, you can only be sentenced to uh, community service or a fine they, because they don't have a jail. There's no funding for a jail. If you want to put somebody in jail, you would have to fly them somewhere and it, they don't get funding for that. <laughs> I'm not going to fund that. would be crazy. Uh, you know, there's, they're out, you know, they're on this island out in the middle of the island range. They have a casino, um, but it's basically for the members to go on a Friday night and just sort of give the money they got from the tribe back to the tribe. <laughs> So that thing's not making money, right? So, so they don't even, so the one tribe with a reservation and a police force doesn't, isn't, isn't doing true criminal. They're not incarcerating people for a long time. So they have to come up with ways to be able to keep peace in the community short of incarceration. The, then I've got to have Chickaloon, the one tribe that's been able to get a peace officer uh, commission for their, uh, one of their officers by the state of Alaska. And like I said, the state has tried to pull it back several times. I'm not sure how it happened, but they talked them into it. I'm um, very proud of them. The other thing that funny was about Chickaloon is I was reading their codes, and they have three layers of appellate courts. 
And I was like, I don't understand why you have three layers of appellate courts. And they said, well, we heard you have to exhaust remedies before you can go to federal court. So we, if we make you go through three appellate divisions before you can get to federal court because you, you have to exhaust before you can get to federal court. That way nobody can go to federal court. I'm like, well, that probably isn't going to work <laughs> under another doctrine that I'm not going to talk about. But uh, I like them. They are very creative uh, and very, uh, very tenacious. They're also known as, affectionately known as chickaloonies. Uh, the biggest place of law enforcement in Alaska is the VPS Road Program, the, the Village Public Safety Officers. Um, these are state officers, actually, that go through the troopers. They're not commissioned. They're not carrying. They are managed by the, the tribal, the big regional intertribal corporations. Um, and they are not everywhere. But some villages do have a VPSO, which can investigate but you always have to call in the troopers, and usually, depending on the weather, they might be able to be there in six hours. They might not be able to be there for six days. And you hear horror stories of a murder in the village and having to sit watch over the body and the crime scene for days waiting for a trooper to be able to get in to, to do an investigation. Um, but the VPSO program is the only program available. So what this means uh, in Alaska are a few things. One is that they desperately do need tools, but at the same time, the lack of having the tools that we have down here, they have still continued to use very traditional methods to be able to solve disputes. Very much community-oriented, and also very much non-Western. So you do hear it a lot of places, well, we don't, uh, you know, you want a judge that doesn't know anybody, that's unbiased. Up there, they're like, no, no, you want a judge that knows everybody. So when somebody's coming in and talking to them, they're not gonna give them a story they know your story already. Uh, it's a lot easier to come in and talk to a judge and, and lie to a judge if you don't know the judge. It's a lot harder to come in and do that, as many people have said today, if it's your grandmother. Um, so they, that's another thing that they have uh, in place, these very traditional ways, very communal, very clan-oriented to be able to resolve disputes. What they don't have is uh, the ability for especially outsiders coming into the village um, or their own members who are truly violent to be able to uh, manage them through their systems. But this change, we're seeing money start to flow into Alaska for the, through the VAWA 2022. And what I'm curious is, is what's going to happen in Alaska? Are they gonna be able to retain both the ability to provide justice in their communities and still retain their very unique, I wouldn't say unique, we have it down here, but unfortunately, so many of our tribes have lost it. I mean, my tribe, I would like to say my tribe is still very traditional, but in terms of justice, we don't really know what our true traditional justice was um, post-colonization. Um, they still do, uh, and so it's a, it's a, it's a very exciting time, um, and I'm happy to be able to be up there. Thank you. Well, we've got a few minutes, and so I would like to take the opportunity. First of all, thank you very much, both of you. Um, I learned so much, um, and uh, it's really something. Um, I would, can you, each of you, talk a little bit, maybe tell a story about um, one of the traditional approaches that you've seen, whether it was in the court that you were presiding over, or a process you were presiding over, or one that you knew, and, and you, I, I want, there are some people in the audience who don't know much about restorative justice, or this sense of how, you, how it is you go about bringing somebody back, the accountability and healing, and bringing someone back in the community. So if you'd each be willing to share a story, that would be helpful. Well, one great, concept that's going around now, are, I mean, that's a procedure that was created from that point of view is the wellness courts that come from the drug courts. Um, but we, 
uh, when tribes were getting together to do that, we saw the 10 key components and looked at it in a different light. The 10 key components of drug court say one thing, and then the tribal people came and kind of put it into this other sense, more restorative, more whole, more holistic, and, and there was gonna be no other way of doing it. And so then we're thinking even the title, we're not gonna call our courts drug courts at home. So we had this thing, wellness, going on, and, and my aunt had this wellness thing going, so we had wellness thing going on. So let's call them wellness courts. So we're sitting in a, a meeting in D.C., and there was a group of us, a tribal something committee. And so we said, wellness courts. Okay, we're going to call them wellness courts. And then Donna Arch from North Carolina, um, not North Carolina, from um, Eastern Band of Cherokee. She's since passed away not so long ago. She says, well, why not um, healing two wellness courts? And she goes, because we're not wellness courts. We're not all well right then. We're healing to wellness. And so the whole healing to wellness. And so the tribes thought the whole idea of drug court went to healing to wellness courts. So the non or whatever that fancy word is for the name is healing to wellness. And that brings in that whole idea. And so all these courts have then developed. And, and he was part he's he can tell you about, he worked with them too. I did TA for his court a long time ago and they were doing their wellness court, but that whole notion of how each one does it, and some of them have their own ways of doing it. The seven uh, ideals are seven teachings up here. Um, Mill acts, that's all woven into their wellness court. It's all a part of it, and it's all mentioned can in the code. Can you just specifically tell us how it operates? I mean, what is it that's going on? Uh, you, you can do that part. Okay. Okay. Sure. Um, can you hear me? Is this on? It take, it'll take right. a long time. You have to, is it on? Uh, I think so. So yeah. uh, uh, healing the wellness court it does draw a lot from the drug court model. So, but the, the goal of it is, is that you individualize to the person and you staff the person. Uh, you don't just run them through and just sort of do one size fits all. Somebody comes into it, you do an assessment of them, you talk about them, you try things with them, you encourage them, uh, you provide them incentives if, when they're doing well, you do a sanction or a response if they're not doing well, but that sanction or response is not a throw them in jail for 30 days like you would normally do in a probation uh, violation hearing, it's two days. Eight but, hours. And, and, or eight hours. Actually, I had the best luck with, uh, I had the best luck with, uh, in Tulalip, they had church pews uh, for the galleries with no padding. And I, I would more often have them come in and have to sit on the church pew for four hours without a friend or a phone. Uh, and I don't know how many times I heard, I would, can you just send me to jail? I'm like, no, because I know. Because <laughs> the people that I was working with, they were all hard core. This was at a hard, uh, Tulalip on, is on I-5. They have an enormous opioid problem. And the people that we were working with were also people that I'd been representing. I don't want to talk about the ethics of all this. We worked it out. But uh, people that I had represented over and over uh, who had, were only successful in the Healing to Wellness Court. But it's keeping them, individualizing it, trying things, making their life difficult if they uh, didn't comply with the orders but not throwing them away, letting them know that, all right, you're gonna have to go do community service, you're gonna have to go do sit on the bench, maybe I'll put you in jail for a night or two nights, um, but that's sort of a last resort. Um, but then next week, you're right back in front of me, we don't just let you go, you're gonna be with me for at least a year, so you might as well get used to it. And just constant encouragement and consistency and getting to know them and them getting to know you is a huge part of it. I think that's the biggest part is that just building the rapport as humans working together, these healing and wellness courts, uh, allow the rapport to build between the participants and the judge and their team. And um, so it's a very much a wraparound um, method of, of encouraging them to make it through. And the more and the longer you can keep them sober, the better their chances are at staying sober as they rewire their brain. So it's, it's modeled. Um, it has a lot of traditional components. There's a lot of ways tribes can incorporate tradition into them and do, uh, and uh, I'm a huge fan of them because, like I said, I had people that I represented over and over and over and over, never successful, and then the Healing to Wellness Court, they were successful, and so I was sold. Let me ask you a couple of specific questions because there are people in, in the room that would, would know that at what stage, I mean, if somebody commits an act of some kind, 
um, are they charged criminally and then referred, or are they convicted and referred, or how do they get it, into the court? The structure of the wellness courts could be varied. It could be a uh, deferred kind of sentence. It could be it could be sentence. A lot of them do not like the sentencing. I used to sentence my defendants to wellness court. Other courts just like to have the pre-trial or not get into any of that. So, but it's up to the, the jurisdiction to decide how they're going to do it from what they have. Some people don't have public defenders. Some people, you know, it, it, they're also different. So the structure of it's going to be based upon what the tribe needs and wants. If they have that, that adversarial process already vetted, they're going to do more like some people want to do like a court, more like a state drug court. Others are going to probably do a little different and say, no, we're going to hold these charges on you, and if you go and go to treatment, go to do all these different things, treatment out there, but also maybe sweat and, and all these things. But then you'll have a kid, like I had a kid say, you can't send me to sweat, Joey. That's violation of church and state. This is a fourth grader from the reservation <laughs> telling me. So, so I said, I don't even know how to answer him. I mean, right off the bat. But it, there's even those things that come up with kids because they have this sense... But it's up to the tribe to figure it out, what they might do. And there's variations all over. And there's more now than when I was doing a lot of the work, more developing, more trying to figure out and how they might work. I was talking to some other people today that they have to work with the jurisdiction, jurisdiction next door. And some public law 280 states, they have county relationships and they have to work with them. And they have to, the judges have to come together. And in Oklahoma, there's one at Tahlequah and up in Minnesota, the Grass Lake, or Cass Lake and different places where they have to have interjurisdictional you know, issue, uh, MOUs to try to help them because otherwise they couldn't get it done. So there's just, the variation is so strong that it, it, it's too long to describe it all, I guess, in a way. Yeah, but I think the, 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 the philosophies of it can be used anywhere. You can even use it without it being a wellness court. Yes. It's just some of the things of, of and, and that's why we're seeing the family uh, drug courts or the family healing to wellness courts work for child welfare cases, because the systems that we have for child welfare are designed to fail. Uh, we send our parents out with a case plan. You're going to do all of this stuff, or we're going to keep your kids, and we'll see you in two months. Good luck, and let them go. And that doesn't work. They fail. They have barriers. They detach from their children over time, and they just become fatalistic that it's never going to happen, and they walk away. But you can incorporate the same thing into that to where you're like, I'm going to see you next week. And I'm going to see you the week after that. I'm going to see you the week after that. I'm going to reward you when you do well. I'm always going to find something positive to say, even if it's just that you showed up. Your UA might have been a Christmas tree, everything hanging on it. Uh, and you didn't do anything. But if you showed up for court, that, especially if you knew what I was, I was going to be unhappy with you, you know, that's a good thing. Give them a, a, you know, true true encouragement for the things that they do, that builds a rapport with them, an engagement with them, and it also doesn't give them a long period to where they know that they can use, because that, that addiction is going to talk to them. And it, it's kind of like, um, well, it's me with cupcakes, right? <laughs> I can look at a cupcake. I know that I need to lose weight, but I know also if I eat the cupcake, I'm not going to gain 30 pounds. <laughs> by just by eating the cupcake, right? It's a long-range problem. <laughs> so I eat the cupcake, right? It's the same thing for drugs. It's like, well, I'm not going to get in trouble because I'm not going to see the judge for 30 days, and I won't get a warrant until then anyway. Well, I might as well use because the, the, the penalty isn't going to happen. But if they know the penalty is going to be next week, it's a lot easier for them to not eat the cupcake. Hmm. So... You know, you can incorporate those philosophies into your regular dockets. People that are, are what I call frequent flyers, it's like, I'm going to know you're going to come in and see me next week. I'm going to see you. We're just going to touch base, see how you're doing, and try to build that rapport and encourage them. And also tell them I'm not going to throw you away. I'm not going to toss you for six months because mm -hmm. you didn't do the giant list that we give you to do while your brain is still trying to unwire from being a heroin addict for the last five years. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'd say about restorative justice and the process procedural side of it, peacemaking is going to take a lot more time than the justice system has. You, you want to get them in there, and you're going to need to talk and talk and talk with a lot of people, and courts are not set up to do that. If a court can start from that point of view, and they know they're going to be there in a long time, I, I, there's so many people at home 
when I see them coming, gosh, we can just sit over there. I even said in another talk, give them those things you hit each other with and go out there and just hit each other until you can't anymore to get all of that out. And then you can start talking about things. But it takes way more time than justice system judge and clerk and everybody has. And that's one of the worst situations because we know from past, for our, our Wallapai history, is that they would bring in a head man or somebody from the next band over to come and listen. And they would go talk for as long as they needed to before it could get resolved. And, and that time factor is, is, a, is one of the worst things that block true, true healing and restorative justice. And how you work around that is, is everyone's biggest question, I think. I know the model differs, but are there elders of some kind in, in most of these or not? Is it mainly people that are going to, family or other connections? Yeah, you, you often have components of it where you have elder advisors. Um, we always had elder advisors and cultural advisors um, who guided us on things and also helped come up with things that people could do. Um, I was always, I was just as happy to have somebody go attend a cultural event as I was for them to go pick up garbage on the beach for community service. Um, and having people who could guide them through that, make sure that they showed up on time and taught them about what was happening along the way is incredibly valuable. And that's one of the ways tribes have incorporated culture into the, the what is, was the drug court model. Um, we also at Tulalip used an elders court or an elders panel for younger, um, uh, not juveniles, but for younger adult offenders. Uh, we would often divert them into the elders court, which I had no say over. They made it clear once that you went to elders, they went to elders. and. They didn't, I didn't get a chance to tell them, but they had their whole system. First thing that they did was a family tree. They would sit down with the person with all these elders from the tribe, and they would do their family tree with them and then tell them stories yeah. uh, along the way. The, the lady, Be oh, I'm sorry. No, no. That's right. The Good. Beth I was telling you about, she's yeah. an elder. And then I would send them from just a regular juvenile court. And so trying to get that knowledge of an older person. But not every older person's an elder, though. So I mean, <laughs> we, we, some of them have missed that boat. Yeah. But, but this lady knew a lot of stuff, and she would get after you and tell you, and they didn't like to go to her, but putting them into her, and the you know, first one was her grandkids, but to send another one, that, that, that knowledge, that wisdom, that life that she's had, and that, even that, that stick that she could you know, say with her words, not with her hands, was a part of that. And that was even, that was my first year of being a judge just out of law school, the first year, not even knowing. They just put me in the position, just thinking, how might I do that? So that's when some tribal people, when they go home, if they know their people, they're, the big, they're gonna be the ones that can kind of develop a lot of new ways of doing things and incorporating stuff that only they would know. Because if we go somewhere else, you know, going up, I've been to Chickaloon before. Yeah. I asked some um, honey, for, or uh, what do you call it? You put on pancake stuff there one time. But they create their own ways of doing it. And it's going to, we have to just let them and bring, bring them knowledge and help to do that. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, like, for the elders panel, we looked at it. And for a young uh, offender that went to elders and completed it, um, they had a double, the, they had, their, their rate of non-offending in the future was double if they completed elders. I think I did that backwards. They were twice as likely not to come back to my court if they completed elders than someone who just took a straight up plea and went into probation. Um, and so that was, a, that was a very successful court. It's hard because it takes, like you said, it's such a commitment that for those elders to come every week and sit with their uh, participants for hours. Um, but if you're, they're willing to do it and able to do it, it is, it is the the statistics show that it is way more successful than any standard probation system. Same with healing to wellness courts. Well, thank you both very much. Thank you. Great talk. It's, so, it's 2 10, so I'm going to, we're going to keep going. Um, I don't know about all of you, but what a rich day it's been, um, learning so many things. Um, and we have, we're going to enter into um, uh, another very different panel. Um, I, I will again introduce everybody, and I'm going to have them each talk a little bit about their work or whatever they want to talk about, and then I will ask them some questions. Um, and uh, each of them have uh, different kinds of um, interests or vocations that are working in the field. 
The first person, who's uh, Samantha Major, sitting next to me, um, her area of focus is Native American literature. Her current research builds on her dissertation, We Are All Related, Contemporary Native American Literature and the Non-Human Turn, to explore the portrayal of natural and cultural materials like beaded dresses, trees, books, cars, and rivers in Native American literature. She has taught courses at the University of Minnesota and St. Olaf College across departments, including English, writing studies, American Indian studies, and race and ethnic studies. In the classroom, she draws on Native American indigenous studies, decolonizing methodologies to instill an ethics of reading and writing. She received her PhD from the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities, her MA in English from the University of St. Thomas, and her BA in English and Sociology from the University of Minnesota Duluth. Seated to her left is McCaw Black Elk. Um, McCaw is the Executive Director for Truth and Healing at Red Cloud um, Indian School in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, a former Indian boarding school, and those who are attached to Mark can't know that a number of Jesuits from this province um, work out there and have spent time out there. He first, um, he first graduated from the University of San Francisco and then earned his master's degree in peace and human rights education at Columbia University's Teachers College in, and in educational leadership from the University of Notre Dame. He was a teacher and an educational administrator at Red Cloud before taking on his current role. A descendant of boarding school survivors, he brings a passion for interreligious dialogue to his work. He also serves as chairperson of the American Indian Catholic School Network and advocates for truth and healing in Catholic ministries and schools serving indigenous peoples. And the third person um, at the table is Sterling Knox. He is a Marquette um, PhD student and recidivism reduction initiative coordinator on Red Lake Nation. He studies indigenous historical, racial, and cultural philosophy and social, I'm not going to say this right, Epi, what is it, epistemology, is that right? My husband will know, he always has to correct me on my pronunciation <laughs> and things. Now, his research has been centered around addiction and agency, the aim to develop a framework for thinking about agency and responsibility in an Anishinaabe. Anishinaabe. Okay, well, good thing I've got natives here. <laughs> Context. His hope is to provide an expansive notion of agency as socially constituted to serve as a basis for possible alternative approaches to healing and treatment. And he's done, he's done a lot of work in, um, in reentry work as well. So I'd like you all to welcome this, our three next panelists. <laughs> and I'm going to start with Samantha. Just wanted to say a greeting um, that I've been taught by my, my language teachers, uh, protocol, to say hello all my relatives. Uh, my name is Sam Major, and I am Dakota and uh, Assiniboine, I said specified, Ihangtuan uh, or Yankton Dakota is my, my family background. And um, I have the, the privilege and pleasure of teaching here at Marquette in the English department. Um, and uh, my specialty is, of course, Native American literature. And uh, I've, I was wondering you know, uh, how I would fit among, among the panels uh, today, looking at the, the wonderful speakers, um, folks who are involved in, in the law and justices and I, I'm, you know, what is an English professor doing here? Uh, but the power of stories has been mentioned um, time and time again today and so that's made me feel a little bit like, okay, I, you know, uh, uh, there, there is purpose here. So um, what I do in, in the classroom and like I said, I have the privilege to do is I teach uh, fiction, I teach novels, I teach poetry, and um, every semester I, I ask students to imagine the world a little bit differently, and I think that art 
in various forms has the power to um, encourage our imagination. And today as we're talking about restorative justice and thinking about perhaps the ways in which um, the U.S. justice system, as it, as it has uh, traditionally been, uh, maybe isn't working for us so well, and the ways that restorative justice can come in, I think we really need that, that key of, of imagination, of thinking about um, there, are, there are different models and different systems that, that may be um, not only of use, but uh, needed in this particular time. And so I think about teaching, for instance, uh, selections from uh, Ojibwe writer Louise Erdrich and her Justice Trilogy. So if you're looking for, for some books, and I encourage you to explore some of these ideas through literature, um, Plague of Doves, The Roundhouse, La Rose. When I have students reading a book like La Rose where uh, you have um, something of a domestic drama. You have neighbors, non-native neighbors next to native neighbors, and uh, the, the father figure in, in the native home accidentally shoots the son of, of the neighbors. Um, and then the plot thickens when the native family, uh, in their traditional ways, gives their son in restitution to, to their neighbor family. And students have to consider um, what is largely to them a very unusual form of justice. Um, we're always asking, what does justice look like? And how can we consider things that perhaps we've never uh, been taught to consider before? Um, so I find literature to be very useful for that. I also wanted to just, um, in, in a brief you know, minute here, um, bring up some of the, the works that are foundational for me when I think about these issues. I often bring into the classroom different selections, but this is a, a book by Wazia Tawim, and it's called What Does Justice Look Like? And in it, she outlines and, and takes as her case study um, Dakota history in Minnesota, Makoche, Minnesota, in particular. And she lays out, in many ways, what, what folks have laid out in, in different ways throughout the day, a process for, for justice that starts first with truth-telling, and then with what she calls tearing down the fort, okay? Dismantling systems that have created injustices. Uh, third, making reparations. <coughs> Fourth, of course, we can't stop there, but creating oppression-free society. Um, you know, there, there are these processes that have been envisioned and that have been imagined, that are imagined in um, our storytelling, and um, so it's a place to find and, and explore some of these ideas further. Uh, so I just look forward to, to talking more. I'll also say um, it's been my privilege to um, co-create and, and help uh, um, support undergraduate research here through the Indigeneity Lab. And the project that I particularly work on is um, understanding our uh, Catholic Bureau of Indian Missions, Indian boarding school records that we ha hold here at Marquette. Um, and with Native undergrad students and graduate students, uh, we're, we're working on um, creating materials that help our community um, and various communities understand what's in these archives, what can these archives furnish as far as evidence when we go through a truth-telling uh, that's being called for uh, now. Thank and Marquette you. is the, the repository for the boarding school records for the country, right? For the, for, for Catholic, Catholic, the Catholic, Catholic boarding, boarding school schools. So, yes. um, well, McCall, we're talking about healing and, and uh, <laughs> trauma, and why don't you tell us about your work? Yeah, no, thank you for the, for the very good segue. Um, so uh, I work as the director for Truth and Healing at Red Cloud Indian School in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. It is the westernmost part of this, uh, certainly province for the Jesuits. Um, and Jesuits here who have been at Marquette are also a big part of the life at Red Cloud. And so it's a historic boarding school run by the Jesuits today, still a K through 12 day school operated 
and, and sponsored by the Jesuits that has a history of being a boarding school on the local community level. And so we're engaged in a process of what we're calling, what we call a truth and healing process. And I want to be very uh, thankful to the previous speakers, especially in particular, um, well, Jason mentioned, right, this idea that restore, we talk about restoring to what exactly? And in other spaces, we talk about reconciliation, reconciled to, to what exactly? And so we've, we've avoided, in particular, the use of the words restorative and uh, reconciliation, and instead focus on the word healing, because at the very least, we recognize that regardless of you know, whether any of those other things are, are possible, that individual healing still is. And so at my, in my work, we do, we're sort of taking what has happened certainly at the country level in Canada and are applying parts of that to a very small community of just one school and trying to engage in truth-telling, truth-seeking. Uh, as was mentioned, we follow a process that's very similar to what was yet when we uh, uh, lined up in her writing. Uh, we talk about first engaging in, in confronting the truth uh, and seeking out the stories of those ind individuals, especially who are alive today, who can tell the story of their boarding school experience. Uh, and then we also move into processes of understanding where we try and really take into account the greater impact of that on our community across generations. And only then is, is really any kind of healing possible and we originally looked at the, you know, the stages that were sort of guiding us and thought you know, in a very linear way that we start these stages, much like any other Truth and Reconciliation Commission has in, in other spaces, in most famously in South Africa, here now just recently in Canada. Um, you know, when governments do this work, it's very much like oh, there's a start and there's a finish. And we've realized that there really is no start and finish to the, the work of Truth and Healing that instead, especially as an institution that represents the broader Catholic Church through our local Catholic school and churches and still being connected to the Jesuits, that we instead have a responsibility to engage in any and all activity that helps individuals on the path toward healing. Uh, and in other spaces, I've talked about how certainly last year, some people were made familiar with this journey in Canada uh, and its relationship to the Catholic Church because Pope Francis visited Canada in person to make an apology. And the reaction to that amongst Native peoples, both in Canada, First Nations and Métis peoples, as well as here in the United States, I think really encompassed the full breadth of just how um, the church's role in this uh, history is, certainly has an outsized impact, but that even the actions of someone like Pope Francis going to Canadian soil to offer an apology highlights the varying needs of individual Native people in order to heal. For some people, Pope Francis's visit was a deeply needed thing. And when hearing his apology and hearing him speak to that, that was something that they were yearning for and that was a closer step on their healing journey. For others, it was deeply triggering and not meaningful or even further harm was done. And so we recognize that as a church institution, that's going to be true for us as well. There are going to be things that we do as a collective uh, organization that will allow individuals to further along that journey of healing. And there will be things that we do that might also be disruptive to that healing for others. And our job is to continuously try and find what uh, pathways are, are needed for individuals to get there. Um, and in, in our work, um, you know, we recognize that, and I'm really actually thankful for, uh, for Joseph to also speak about this. Um, when we talk about historical trauma in the context of being a Catholic institution, I think that's relevant also here at Marquette, um, we recognize that we are sitting in the space of, of an institution that inherits the legacy of perpetrator, and that there is also healing that needs to happen there. Uh, and recognizing that holding on to that legacy of perpetrator means responsibility. It means uh, ensuring that there is work done to uh, engage and address those who would be willing to go through that and hear that. Because as we know, and I'm sure many of you who work in the criminal justice system, um, right, sometimes individuals who are victim survivors of, of harm 
you know, they don't need their perpetrator to be involved at all in order to achieve healing. And others would be greatly benefited by the, uh, by the perpetrator coming in and being forthcoming and being honest and being uh, someone who admits and affirms uh, the harm that the victim has gone through, the victim survivor has gone through. So we try to also incorporate different ways of recognizing our institutional uh, legacy and the need for the Jesuits, the need for uh, the wider Catholic Church, even though this is, yes, a story of a very specific boarding school in a very specific community, uh, it is also the story of a deep relationship between indigenous peoples in this country and the Christian faith here embodied in the Catholic Church as just one of those things. And there is a, a deep uh, uh, divide, I think, for many people. Um, in that relationship or lack thereof. And so we work to try and talk about that first and foremost, uh, recognize that, and also engage in efforts to uh, achieve a greater sense of healing for both, again, those who are uh, boarding school survivors and alumni, those who are sitting and, and holding the legacy of perpetrator uh, and sort of working within this microcosm that speaks to a greater a map of sort of what has happened to Native peoples in the United States. And so we're uh, engaged in a very deep conversation locally. Um, the work is certainly challenging and uh, difficult. And um, Esther, as many know, right, it, it requires a very real commitment and a very real openness. Uh, and that's the biggest thing we come across is that the first stage that we, that we follow, it, which is based in, in uh, Native scholarship uh, from Dr. Um, Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart, who is from our community. Uh, she talks about confrontation and as that first stage, and that's the hardest place to go. The hardest place is to admit. The hardest place is to uh, even just engage in the listening to those who have had that experience and to uh, gain the truth. And I'm glad that you bring up also the, the archives here at Marquette, another factor in our work of truth-seeking is that Red Cloud's records um, are here um, at Marquette. Um, this summer, we have a group of, of high school students who are gonna be coming here to engage in research through the archives themselves. We also have a full-time researcher um, who is looking into our archives and asking very uh, specific questions that come from, we developed a, a community advisory council made up of different people uh, people who are boarding school survivors from our institution, people who are activists in the community, people who aren't connected to us, and they serve as a kind of guiding body for the work that we do, and they sort of tell us, right, what is, what is the next thing that Red Cloud should be focused on and doing in order to engage in this work of truth and healing. Um, and so our researcher is full-time, you know, researching those requests. For example, uh, how much funding has Red Cloud Indian School received in its time as a boarding school from the federal government over the whole course of its existence? How much, um, uh, or to what extent um, do we know about all of the students who ever attended our school and where they ever ended up um, and what happened to them, right? Uh, and I think a big other one is, you know, the questions of land, right? How did the Jesuits get the land that they got? in order to have this, this school to begin with, and what was the process to, to get there. Those are just very beginning uh, research questions that help, will help us down the road you know, achieve a greater sense of, of healing for those in our community. Um, so that's just a little bit about what I do. It's, it's not entirely disconnected from what happens in certainly the criminal justice system, but it represents, I think, a greater social uh, uh, dynamic in our relationship as Native peoples to the broader Catholic Church, to the Jesuits, to the history of boarding schools, and how healing in that space um, is both incredibly challenging, but also possible. Uh, and so um, that's just a bit about what I do and what we're bringing to the table. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to ask you, because I've had the privilege of hearing you before, um, and I know that, as I understand it, um, people on the reservation who are willing to talk are being asked not only about their own experiences, but their, their grandparents and their other relatives and family members. Um, but I, one of the things I found interesting when you talked last time was the um, discussion about, first of all, who's doing that interviewing, 
and secondly, the level of um, offers of confidentiality and, and what diff how different people are responding to the question of confidentiality. Yeah, that's a great question, thank you. We, uh, we did take um, a great deal of learning from what happened in Canada and in their process for interviewing uh, residential school survivors there. So people in Canada who were interviewed across the years that they had the Truth and, and Reconciliation Commission were able to give their testimony in numerous ways, either via video, via personal interview, via written, uh, where they wrote their experience via a public forum where they were able to tell their experience uh, publicly and to others and in front of others amongst, say, a circle of other boarding school survivors. Um, so that has also been the case for us, that we've provided a diversity of ways in which for survivors to tell their story um, and to do it also in, in, in multiple capacities. There have, been, there have been elders who are boarding school survivors who in a circle of their fellow boarding school uh, attendees are able to say something, tell parts of their story, but then come to us later and say, there were things I wanted to say that I didn't get to say in that public space and I would like to say them privately. Or there are things I would like to say but I just can't say them and so I'd like to write them down. Um, and so uh, providing those multiple m methods as well as giving them a real sense of, of choice in terms of how that story gets shared or, or doesn't, right? We have a sort of a, a gateway system for a kind of release form, for lack of a better word, um, where people get to decide, will this ever be shared publicly or not, right? Or is it gonna be anonymous or will your name be attached to it? Would you like it to be used for educational purposes in curriculums or not? Would you like it to be available to, to researchers or historians who would like to read those things in the future? Um, and so they get to say yes or no individually to each of those things. Um, and so it really provides the, them with that full choice of how they tell their story, how many times they tell their story, and what format they tell their story, um, and how that story will eventually be shared. Thank you. Sterling, would you be willing now to share a little bit of the work you've done and also your PhD work and what you're working on? All right. So... <clears throat> Uh, bonjour. Uh, I'm making Dej Nakaz Nakaj Wanung Nadunjaba Ajijak Do Dame. So, first, I want to say the, the, the work that I'm going to describe, you know, the work that I do, not really possible without amazing leadership team back home at um, like uh, um, Ms. Kunish um, spoke about Red Lake. Um, uplifting our relatives, you know, Obamendwa, getting away my gunanada, right? Which is a leadership team that, you know, none of the work that I'm that I about to explain is possible without them. So I wanted to say that first. First, I'll give you the the um, the brochure version of of pretty much what it is I do, which is we we, we got pretty much three objectives. I run, I'm 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 the coordinator of a recidivism reduction initiative, um, and then I run a program called Pathways to Wellness. We focus primarily on youth. We got three objectives. One is um, systems level change, policy change, um, creating an integrated system of care, and finding community-based alternatives to detention, right? Re reduce recidivism, individual um, case management, intensive case management, focusing on youth, 12 to 18, and um, we, we, we were referral-based, we work with courts, we work with healing the wellness courts, we work with, um, we get referrals from families, and we get referrals from schools, and navigating that gets tricky, and we're here for it, right? Um, that's the brochure version. Um, the non-brochure version is Buch as a right? You matter, what, what your actions matter, um, what you do matters, right? And we try to work with these youngsters over a long period of time because relationship building requires that. Trust needed for that type of transformation requires that. So we first, we, we try to build that relationship to show that you matter because maybe they, they've been having experiences to where they don't feel like they do, right? Or maybe their conditions in which they live have showed them that maybe they don't as they experience it. So we try to, you know, be there, be present, walk with them, hold hands as we you know, journey into what we can consider healing. And then with, uh, up, upon that trust and with, upon that relationship, then we can start talking about what restoration looks like, what healing looks like, um, and, and given a broader context when we're talking about um, 
with, was this Joseph the rap, you know, he's talking about rapping. There's a lyric that says, you know, colonialism, historical trauma to enslavement, it don't do nothing um, about the pain, it just explains it, right? Where do we get once we're, 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 building, we're building on this relation of trust and we get to that space where we're starting to find and we're starting to gain a sense of self? You know, we, we can describe all of these, these conditions which got me to where I'm at all day long, but what do I do about it? Where's my sense of self? Where's my sense of agency in this? Where can I act? What can I do? That's, that, that's giving back healing to some of these youngsters, and that's what we're trying to do in community, with community, right? Because one of, one, of the, the, um, one of the goals of the initiative, too, was when Chair Masiki said, bring our kids home, right? Because for too often, it sent them out. Send them here, send them there, go to detention. But no, it's like we have, we have remedies in community. We have space in community. We have pathways to, to wellness in community. And we have transformative you know, activities that can, that's not only transformative for itself, but it's transformative of community for our, for our relatives that's coming after us. So that's, that's, that's pretty much the gist of it. Um, any given day, <laughs> you know, I might be in a meeting over here talking about self-governance or the JJDPA, and then, you know, I might end up over here the next hour helping a youngster with the homework or 10 o'clock at night flashing my brights behind a car full of a bunch of little heads that I can see, <laughs> and I jump out and be like, what are you doing? And they're like, oh, man, bro, you're tripping. But, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's that type of relationship, right? It, it's taking time. It's taking time, and I, and I love that. Right, because there's I can go to I can go to grandma's house and get yelled at because I knocked and leave with a plate, right? And then I can go sit at these tables with the state and make sure that they understand that we're not sub sovereign, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I love my job, and like I said, it wouldn't it wouldn't be possible without the leadership at Obamendua. Could you share a story of somebody you've worked with that you've seen a transformation in? Is there somebody that comes to mind if I ask that question? Oh yeah, there's plenty. There's plenty. One, um, okay, so a um, couple years ago, in the wake of COVID, there was a spike in youth violence. Um, lots, of, lots, of, lots of gang conflict. It started from a split of one that split into two. Um, there was a, it was a lot. It was weekly gun violence, weekly, right? So we, as a community, came together, a lot of different uh, partners who, and, and concerned people that said, yeah, we need to do something about this. So we had restorative circle. And we pulled in a lot of these youngsters. We focused on the, the, the key folks, because like, if you follow like, uh, violence interruption, et cetera, it's usually this, a small group that's responsible for most of what's taking place. So we, f we focused on these youngsters and we had a small circle and a much larger circle around which community people showing that we're here to support you. We're not here to, we're not here to say that you're wrong. We're not here to tell you that you're doing, we're not here to um, talk about deficits, right? We're here to support you because that's what community is for. So we had two separate um, rooms where we talked to um, individuals and then we brought them together in the big room and they're able to, you know, um, uh, deal with the conflict and came together, you know, and, and they agreed to stop the violence, right, for, for one. But there was one, one youngster there that was not with it and didn't want to be there, left early, was <laughs> not feeling it, right? <laughs> so so uh, I continued to work with them over course of what, like 16 months, just every day, trying to work with them, trying to find um, outlets in the community. Uh, we had this um, internship with the DNR to learn about Lake Shore Ecology, then, and also to clear the bull rush to create um, a swimming area for, for youth in this community, or else they gotta go up, the, go up about eight miles north, right? So this, it's a community service, and we're learning, and I'm, and I'm putting some money in your pocket. Right? So this is all, you know, trying to create this, help this relationship, build this relationship with this young man. And he, you know, he, for, for the longest time, he had, he, he, he had this attitude that, no, you know, you're still them people, you're still, you're still the system, you're still um, just out to get me. Fast forward to most recently, um, there was a, you know, uh, he had a, there's a, found himself in a, in a predicament and in detention. And, you know, I have a reputation 
with the youngsters as, you know, when somebody gets in trouble, like my phone blows up. And then they call me like, yo, you got to get the homie out of jail. And I'm like, that's not my job, right? <laughs> that's not my job. I can, I, can, I can help, you know, find alternatives to the system, right? That's, that's where I'm at. And um, so when I went in, I kind of expected a little bit, you know, this is a, you know, um, self-reflective moment. I kind of expected him to try to give me the spiel to get him out of jail. And oh, I'm leaving a part out. So there's the prosecutor who, um, when I came to this work, had a hard-nosed um, reputation. People, the kids feared him. He's non-negotiable. So over the same 16 months, me and him have established quite the relationship, and we talk all the time, and he's, we're aligned. And when I went to go talk to the youngster in detention, I expected him to give me a spiel to try to get out, but he says, the first thing out of his mouth was, the prosecutor's disappointed in me, ain't he? Right, like he, he had his, via the three of us, over the course of this time, had built a relationship, Buches and Chagain, like you matter, right? But what you do matters, and what you do matters to us, right? So he was more concerned about what, what we thought about the situation he found himself in than any punitive responses, right? So um, I, t I, I, I seen that as that's, that, that's what we're here to do. That's what we're here to do, because that's going to go 10 times further than a deterrent. Right, than, than some sort of sanction. That's gonna, because he, thinking about, I'd rather have a youngster thinking about what I think about his decision in a moment when he, it's a fork in the road than a consequence. Because I think it's gonna get way more mileage. Thank you. Uh, Sam, um, you know, liberal arts are sort of the heart and soul of a Jesuit institution, and so you're part of that. Um, and um, I, I'm going to ask each of you this question, but in working with students and having them read, um, write, um, have a deeper understanding of indigenous people's culture, what gives you the most hope for the future? Mm, that's a great question. What get, well, my students give me a lot of, a lot of hope. <laughs> I, draw, I draw on them a lot. Um, I... I I'll just start here. I often feel a little bit bad uh, for my students because I think they come into Native American literature thinking it might be, you know, uh, more like Disney's Pocahontas than it is what it is, which is genocide and sexual assault and really difficult, very heavy topics where every semester I wait for it, I have at least one, and I teach largely non-native, uh, largely white, white students here at Marquette. It's just, that's the, the factor of our population here um, at Marquette. And inevitably, about a month in, in their reflection papers or uh, you know, a reflection paragraph in class, I will have a student write, I'm shocked. I, I don't know why I wasn't taught these things. Um, I feel guilty. I feel ashamed to be me. And that's when I know, uh, you know, it's time for, for a little talk with everybody. Um, because I find that often to be the biggest barrier to, to teaching the subject matter that I need to teach is that, that feeling of guilt or shame. Um, and I say, you know, we have to understand what is our responsibility here in learning this? What is our responsibility to these histories and some of our darkest histories um, and these, these very difficult, complicated, shared histories that we have? Well, our responsibility is to know it and to co-create a better future. And so you have to kind of put up that type of a boundary so that we don't get mired in to this feeling of uh, really, you know, we're, we're, it turns the focus on, on the self to be like, oh, I feel so guilty. I'm so sad that this happened. Um, let's turn it into purpose. Um, and it's forward looking. How do we address these things? And what does it mean to know it? When you know that 
Um, we've had over a century of Native children being taken and removed from their homes in a, a genocidal assimilative program, first with boarding schools and then through adoption. Um, then you understand ICWA. And then you understand what they're talking about on the news when we're talking about this Supreme Court case coming through. And then we as citizens can make decisions on how we vote, how we speak up about these subjects. Um, when it was being portrayed as uh, an issue of race and not an issue of, of national sovereignty, you know, how do you, how do you have that understanding when, when your entire education until you get to my college course hasn't prepared you to think about that. Um, so, so that work gives me hope. Um, when I can intervene in some ways, sometimes it's very tough. Uh, sometimes I have students who resist uh, and are kind of in disbelief of, of the material and, and the stories that our Native writers tell. Um, but what I love about literature and art in particular, and um, as you said, you know, all the liberal arts uh, work in this way, but I, I, you know, I'm partial to, to a, a fiction. Um, I often think that, and I, and I love uh, my, my friends in history, but I often think fiction um, does sometimes a better job of telling history, especially when it's these most difficult histories. Um, and although fiction isn't, reality, it is often truth. And, and so seeing students sort of come to these histories through, through the arts um, is really rewarding. It gives me a lot of hope for our future. Great, thank you. Well, McCaw, you're in a lot of heavy stuff <laughs> in, in your position, um, but what gives you hope? Uh, I'll first acknowledge that sometimes it's hard to have hope. Um, at times, I mean, when you're just in these the the darkest places of of sort of human disconnection, um, it can be hard to have that. Um, I think similarly, uh, you know, as a part, of, we're we're also you know a school system, and so part of the boarding school, part of the boarding school project that we're engaged in means that we're also engaging our students, not just people who are boarders, right? We're trying to have boarding school. Uh, curriculum and sort of like and really bring in sort of this knowledge uh, in a full way it can be really challenging you know as, as you have the experience of uh, especially a lot of non-indigenous peoples facing native history for the first time and, and having that reaction of maybe guilt or um, uh, as you all described right like um, when we start having our indigenous students engage in their own history in, the, in these very deep ways sometimes that reaction can be of a, of a sort of deep-seated anger. Um, and it, literature has called that, in, at least in the educational space, like this kind of like red rage, right? Um, and it can create really difficult um, and challenging uh, moments for some of our teachers um, or just people who are working with our young people um, where you, know, you have students express things like, after the learning parts of their history, saying things like, well, the only conclusion they can come to is, and like this is literally coming from the mouths of students, right? Like, well, all white people must be evil. And that's not the conclusion you want them to walk away with, um, and, and certainly not something that helps in a movement towards healing. Uh, and that's what I think does give me hope, is that um, though it's very difficult, though it's very uh, certainly rhetorically challenging, um, you know, we, we make sure to recognize that our process is about truth and healing. And sometimes, especially, I'll say in my space, especially Catholics, want to jump to healing right away. Um, they're like, we need to go there, right? We gotta go to healing. Um, and then other times, and especially the non-Catholic indigenous community, they wanna stick to truth, right? They're like, we wanna stay here. And it's really partly about reminding both communities like, that this is about both, right? Like, this is about, engaging in the truth, engaging in recognizing and confronting this history, and it's also about how we overcome and how we find community, how we develop resiliency, how we focus on uh, not just being trauma-informed, but really healing-informed as, as a school system, as a, as a community. Um, that there are certainly major, major challenges, but that healing is still possible. Um, and so that certainly gives me 
uh, a lot of hope when I'm able to sort of sit in that space and recognize those conversations. And I'll, and I'll give really one small anecdote, and I'll probably make this go over time, but um, we had a, a big group of protesters come to our campus like two years ago. Um, and uh, it was people from the local community, people I grew up knowing. Um, and uh, they came to our campus to protest. It was just after Canada had had its sort of summer of terrible news about the uh, uh, residential schools and the rediscovery of unmarked graves. Um, and so they came to our campus, we welcomed them, we helped them have access to bathrooms, offered them food, like gave them a microphone um, and a speaker system uh, and helped them have their protest. And uh, that, went, that was good. People got a lot of great energy out there. A lot of good things were said, difficult things were said. Uh, I invited that group to come back and talk with us further, right? How, like, we're doing this truth and healing work. How can we, you know, hear you and, like, do the things that you're asking also? Incorporate what you're asking into what we're doing. Um, and that ended up being a very difficult, like, four-hour meeting. It was, it was not expected to be four hours. In my calendar, it was just one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what ended up being really powerful about that meeting was less the conversation that the activists were having between myself, my colleagues, and, and them, but more what was started happening in the conversation among themselves. And at one point, one of the elders in the group um, said to his fellow uh, activists, um, he said, you know, we came here to this place, to this school, to this church, and we, were, we wanted a fight. We wanted to come in here, and we wanted to fight with them, and we wanted them to fight back, right? We wanted them to argue with us and be angry at us, right? And we're not getting that. Instead, we're getting acquiescence. Instead, we're getting understanding. Instead, they're listening. And he said, sometimes we just have to trust. Um, and I thought that was, uh, for me, will always be a moment where I'll take with me moving forward in terms of what gives me hope is sometimes I just have to trust. Thank you. And Sterling, what gives you hope in the work that you do or even looking at the bigger picture? Um, I say, there's, I think there's, there's a few things that give me hope. One is being able to participate in and experience the transformation um, of going from drafting arguments to, you know, for why these youngsters need to be released from detention to those same folks that we were drafting letters to saying kids don't belong in jail, right? And, and being able to participate in and experience that transformation of, uh, you know, of a viewpoint. And then I would say the anger in some of these youth give me hope because it's a thinking anger. They're mad at what we gave them. And so then there's space there then to expand it from the, from their articulation in, 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 into a, a broader context and it help you know, contribute to their meaning making processes, right? Give them, give, to, to again, strengthen that sense of, sense of self and finding their agency in the world. And then also I'd say, it's just like, I, I, I do direct care work too, you know, and it's just being there with the kids every day and, and showing up to the school and picking up, going to pick up three kids for ceremony and leaving with my big black Nissan full because it's, oh, Sterling's here, right? Or going and pulling up in quote unquote hood and there's a couple youngsters that are gonna get on with us and they got a bunch of friends that are not participants in our program but are, are part of, you know, in that quote unquote at risk group. And they want, can we come? Absolutely, come on, where are we going? Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna go get some mana nuts, right? So let's go. And, and, and that's the type of stuff that, that gives me hope. If I was stuck doing admin work all day like they, I'm supposed to be, uh, I'd, be I'd be going crazy. <laughs> well, I'm gonna ask you each one last question. We have a number of people both here and um, who are watching remotely online um, who this is sort of their first exposure really to the, all the in-depth topics we've had today. Um, if you were, if they were to ask you where should they start um, to understand better, to participate, to change? What would you recommend? 
Sam, I'm following you first. You're, you're, the, you're the professor. Maybe it's what they'd read, right? <laughs> yes, you knew where I, right where I was going to go. Um, I think it really does start with education and you know, the, the sort of list of steps that I gave from Wazia to Ween starts with truth telling and um, across the board, that's still the step we're on. Um, you know, like Makah said, we want to rush to the, the end where we're, we're creating an oppression-free society and, and having that healing moment. But we have a whole host of steps uh, yet to take and starts with that truth telling. And so, you know, pick up Wazia Tawin, um, pick up Native American and indigenous authors, whether nonfiction, fiction, or poetry, and I guarantee um, you will be um, maybe shocked and, and maybe heartbroken, but also um, you'll find a lot of, of restorative things um, that, that Native writers and thinkers um, have to offer in, in regard to, to starting um, on that journey to, to potential healing. I mean, uh, I have to be optimistic and believe that it's possible, but it takes work, um, and, and we're in that truth-telling phase that I, I will say, you know, thinking about the boarding school stuff, I worry that in this country we won't have what has happened in Canada and have a national um, investigation. I know there's a national investigation that has been started, but I worry that it will end up being done in sort of a piecemeal, piecemeal school by school, state by state way. Um, and the entire population needs to be educated on these issues, as I said, because it impacts our legislation. It impacts what we do you know, in our judicial systems. It, it impacts the way we think about justice. Uh, so, so we need education. And so that's my where, where to start. Um, yes. Uh, McCall, you are seeped into issues on the reservation and among different um, views on how to approach these matters, but what would you recommend to people who don't know much about these issues? Um, well, you stole it. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I think education is the biggest thing. Um, you know, there's a reason why, I mean, there is, there now both in the previous Congress and in this Congress are bills that are uh, out there to create a national commission on American Indian schools in our residential school boarding schools in the United States. Um, I mean, you know, there's so much uh, work that's being done by the National New American Boarding School Healing Coalition to try and educate senators and Congress people to like to support that. And the education with almost every one of those people starts at ground like at zero, right? Like, people don't know Native history. People don't know. Um, the fullness and the depth of it. And that, that sometimes includes Native people themselves, right? Like, I mean, there's just, I mean, it was said earlier, right, 90% of Native American kids are in the public school system where, you know, we're reduced to a couple sentences in US history, and it's like the Battle of Little Bighorn, um, typically, and that's usually centered on Custer. Um, so, you know, people don't know their own histories, much less uh, the wider community. So it really has to be, uh, a full-fledged effort to just learn. Um, and uh, aside from Wazia Tanwi, I would recommend, there's a really incredibly powerful book that just that came out relatively recently by Denise Lajmodier Le uh, called Stringing Rosaries, which is about the boarding schools, especially in Catholic boarding schools, and documents the experience of different individuals who told their story. So I definitely recommend that um, for people who are interested in learning more about, certainly the history of boarding schools listening to direct people's experience of the boarding school. repeat the name school. of the, the book? I don't know if everybody heard it. Yeah, Stringing Rosaries uh, by Denise Lajmodier. String. Um, Stringing Rosaries. Um, and it definitely puts the Catholic Church's role in those boarding schools in context as well. And Sterling, what piece of advice do you have? Um, as folks in various spaces in the community, I think we all ought to push for the restorative, transformative questions to, to be asked sooner when it comes to, um, in, the, in criminal justice especially. You know, like maybe we start asking restorative, transformative questions at the, you know, with law enforcement. Right. Starting as early as possible with this approach 
And then also time. Um, I think it was uh, Joseph that was mentioning the, the, how, uh, the time. You know, there's often we go before some judges and prosecution will make the, the recommendation for, you know, a youth or somebody, even, you know, even adult um, to do X, Y, Z in the next 60 days, 90 days. And, um, but <laughs> I have a youngster that I've, that, I, that I've been working with for about two and a half years. And for the first nine months, like we, it was just running from me, right? Just, just running from me and trying, and me trying to build a relationship and, 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 and the adversarial relationship till now, um, not wanting to leave the program and saying, can you bring me to prom, right? Like so that took time, it took energy, it took people, it took care, it took community. And, and just, you know, the 90-day the, the review or 60-day review with X, Y, Z to be accomplished by then and you're free just doesn't really seem like a good model. Well, I want to thank the three of you. Um, I, I'm going to tell you that in a few minutes we're going to take a break. Um, that um, not only because we've got on the program that the Chief Justice is going to come and reflect a little bit on the day, and I know that she wants to talk about the peacemaking program that they have on the Navajo Nation um, part of the system, but we're also going to invite um, Chief Judge Mary Trigiano, who's going to be my successor, but who oversees the treatment courts in Milwaukee, so she can give you a snapshot of what's going on currently in, in the court system, both in, you'll some, some of you will be happy to hear, not only in adult court, but also in juvenile court and working with parents and children. So let's, at this point, thank these three panelists for their wonderful contribution. We're going to spend a few minutes um, with um, Chief Justice Jane um, and her reflections and things she wants to add. And then I've asked, as I indicated, um, I've got all these chiefs here. Chief Judge Mary Trigiano, as I told you, is gonna be the successor for the Andrews Center, but who also oversees and has played a big role in the development of some of the treatment courts in Milwaukee to talk both about the conference if you wanna reflect on the conference, but particularly I think it's important for people from this community to know what is happening in our courts in terms of trying to incorporate some of the richness that we heard today. So I'm going to just turn right away to um, the Chief Justice and uh, share away. Thank you. The Navajo Peacemaking Court, it's not a court, it's a program. It used to be a court in 2012, was when the Navajo Nation government via the tribal council made a decision that the peacemaking process would not be within the court system. And there were reasons for that. One of the main reasons was that within a Western court system, the traditional fundamental customs, traditions, and so forth would be better served within the community, and it would be better served using those concepts versus the court system. As we all know, the court system, you have civil procedure, you have all these types of procedures, and then you also have evidence rules, you have all of these different types of rules. And at the time, from what I have read, certainly I haven't read the legislative history, however, from reading the information that I have access to that has been published with the judicial branch of the Navajo Nation. It's on the website, so if you want to look at the peacemaking program, you can take a look at their plan of operation since 2012, and you can look at all of the processes and the steps that would be taken in that forum. I wanted to bring that up. There are different types of positions that are within the peacemaking program. There are traditional program specialists. These are individuals that conduct and are part of the process for peacemaking sessions. 
They have expertise in the area. The sacred part about this whole process is that, and because the communities are involved, it can provide educational opportunities to children, to students. And the peacemaking program, individuals, the staff, are able to go to the different courts, no, excuse me, not courts, but to the schools and teach students and to provide that education opportunity to students in regards to how is it that, for example, how can youth be involved in, in the community and how are the tradition and customs available to them? So that is the one of the bigger aspects of the peacemaking program. One, again, is that it is a program because the, the decision makers wanted to take it out of the traditional court system. And so I'll, do you I'll, want to reflect on the day? Yes, I, I, I do. I wanted to, as, as far as the peacemaking, I just want to oh, okay, um, add sure. this, is that the peacemaking process involves individuals who are embroiled in a, either a dispute or maybe a disagreement and so forth. And so because they're involved in that, they are not, they're not um, independent. So, and that's, that's the system and the Western, you know, the Western concept of traditional court system is that you have to have that independence um, by a jurist, by a judge. So those are some really fine lines to, to think about. In, reg at, in regards to reflections of, of the last, uh, last couple of days, Certainly, education is available to all um, here at Marquette, as there are other places in the United States. The process of restorative justice, and if you look further at the article that, that I have and highlighted some of those today, it's called Fairness and Healing. That is the name of the article. So healing is a big part of this whole process of restorative justice. I have heard that throughout today that there are various aspects of what is restorative justice. It can be individualized, it can be group, it can be a one-on-one -on -one with um, your community, um, your family, colleagues, and so on. And the concept of restorative justice is reflected in the discussion that I had today with the Navajo Nation Judicial Branch, the way that it is structured, the way that it has both the Western concept with the court system, with the Supreme Court, and also with district courts. And then added a big part of that, a traditional part of that, is the peacemaking program that is there for, for use by individuals of the communities to utilize. The concept of education within the peacemaking program is about teaching and having the community be peacemakers themselves. So peacemakers can come from the community and they are individuals that can be taught or know of the concepts of and the traditions and the culture that they would utilize in order to assist with individuals that would come to a peacemaking session. Thank you. Thank you. Mary, um, you have an opportunity both if you'd like to reflect a little bit on the day um, but also, um, I had the privilege yesterday of learning a lot about the treatment courts because the Chief Justice, uh, one, one of the things that she did yesterday is meet with some, our, some of our circuit court judges from Milwaukee, along with Mary. Mary brought them over. And I, these courts are all new from when I was on the circuit court bench, so I actually learned a lot yesterday as well, and so I would like her to share some of those things. So. Sure. 
Thank you, Janine. Um, first of all, I have learned a tremendous amount here today. It, it's been a fabulous conference, and I've met a lot of you, and I'm so looking forward to um, coming to Marquette University Law School to be the next director of the Andrews Center for Restorative Justice. So um, I'm, I was very happy to be here today. Um, one thing I would note is that I think I stopped counting the number of times that the word relationship was used, um, relational health, relationships, um, and the other word was community. Um, and it, it started, it brought me back to um, some of the trainings that I have done um, for the last 15 years in the justice system on, on how being trauma informed improves um, justice system outcomes. And there is one slide that we sort of start with and end with when we do our training, and it's a slide that was created by Dr. Bruce Perry, um, and he runs, he, he's done a lot of things, but he's he runs a, and operates the Child Trauma Academy, and, and there's two parts to the slide, um, and my brain um, helped me remember it, so I had to jot it down. But he, he talks about connectedness being the key, and he says our history of connectedness is a better predictor of our health than our history of adversity. Um, and I'll just pause there and say many of the individuals who come to the criminal justice system and the juvenile justice system um, have been um, mired in a tremendous amount of his, historical trauma, stress, and adversity. When we see them, they're often at their worst. Um, and our traditional system um, often harms them further. Um, not always, but quite often. And then the next part of his statement in which we train with is, the superpower of humankind is our capacity to connect or be in relationship it is regulating, it is rewarding, and the major route by which we teach, coach, parent, learn, and then ultimately heal. Um, and so I'd like to start that way when I talk about our treatment courts or our problem-solving courts or our therapeutic courts, uh, as we often call them. Um, because all of those courts, um, and I'm sure the healing to wellness courts, um, in any sense of the word, we're born out of frustration, right? A frustration that our criminal justice system and the way we operate it, the way it was created um, and functions um, is really not a pathway to healing for anybody, not victims, not individual offenders, not others. Um, and so a lot of people in the justice system from judges to prosecutors to advocates to others got together um, and decided, you know, we can do better um, even though we have this system of justice. And so treatment courts were created. Um, and it's, it's national, it's international, it's everywhere, uh, these courts. But Milwaukee decided that they were going to take a crack at it back in, I think the adult drug treatment court was about t 25 years ago now. Um, well before I, well, when did I become a judge? Uh, 2004. So um, right around the time I was a baby lawyer. Anyway, so the, the treatment courts um, were an attempt to get individuals together to talk about some of the things that judges and lawyers are never taught. What are substance use disorders, right? What is mental illness and how do we help um, move people forward when they are experiencing that? What really is intimate partner violence, um, and how do we deal with that? Um, so we got together. We brought in experts and other people that could teach us what they knew about these kinds of issues that impact people and impact people's lives. Um, so we, in essence, have um, the Adult Drug Treatment Court, which is um, uh, in the criminal um, uh, arena. We have the Veterans Treatment Court, which helps veterans navigate the justice system if they've been um, charged with a crime. Um, and we have a pilot mental health treatment court that we're trying to grow because there's a lot of individuals in our system that really need help navigating mental illness um, and recovery. Um, we also have the Family Drug Treatment Court. Um, interesting, they, they do want to change the name of it, but for a variety of reasons haven't yet. Um, because it really is a healing to wellness kind of court. Um, and then we have um, what I call my baby. Um, it's the healthy infant court 
because I, along with Judge Jane Carroll, um, saw the model safe baby courts on a national level, and we said, well, we can do that here in Milwaukee, and we should be doing that for our youngest um, of young children in our child welfare system. So my experience lies in the Family Drug Treatment Court and the Healthy Infant Court, um, and I'll just describe it briefly. Um, it is a team approach to dealing with parents whose children have been removed from their care because of a substance use disorder. There could be other issues, but mostly it's based upon um, a parent substance use disorder, which caused them to neglect their child. Um, parents apply, it's a voluntary program. Um, it's not punitive in any way. We do not use jail as sanctions. Um, having their children removed from their care and not being able to have their child back until they certainly try to, uh, until they're in recovery is, in my opinion, sanctions in and of themselves. But we are all taking a team approach to try to wrap services around the individual parents so that they can get their child safely back um, in their care. Um, imagine, it's, it's a smaller room, it's about a third of this size at Children's Court. Um, I'm not on the bench. I don't wear a black robe. I sit down at eye level with the parents. Other parents are in the room. Um, their lawyers are in the room. The prosecutor is in the room. But so are their treatment providers. So are their um, um, people, their support system. Family might show up if family's healthy enough for them to show up. Sometimes their teenage kids show up. Sometimes their little kids show up and end up sitting on my lap while we talk to the parents. Um, someone once likened it to a very informal 10-step program, but it is more structured than that. But we have the parent in front of us, and we do ask the question, what happened to you? Um, how can we help you? There's no shaming. Um, we try to build trust, we try to build rapport, we try to build healthy relationships with these individual parents so that they can get into recovery. Um, and then sometimes we go around the room. One person talks at a time in a restorative justice fashion. And I might have another parent who is in a further stage or phase of the proceedings talk very open and honest about their um, struggles um, with recovery. And they might say to a new parent, you know, you're lying to the judge, and I'm going to tell the judge to her face because I want to help you. You did use yesterday, didn't you? We may have a, a prosecutor say, look, I know they used, but they kept their child safe, so there's no sanctions going to be involved in this. We may have a public defender say, judge, my client used, so they need to, have to be accountable for that. It's almost like role reversal sometimes. But the whole focus is to get that parent healthier um, and in good relationships into recovery with all of our support so that they can parent their child. Um, the Healthy Infant Court was our understanding that babies of parents who had their children removed um, actually need extra help. They need support from others in the community to build a sturdy foundation so that they actually can be healthy and not end up deeper in the system. So we surround babies with the services they need to help them become healthier as well. So those are the underpinnings. We, we do spend more time, I spent two, almost two plus years with one parent who couldn't get through phase three into phase four into final graduation, she ultimately did but we spend the time with them. It's every Friday afternoon um, with phase one parents and every other Friday afternoon with phase two, three, four, and five parents. So we do spend that time with them, unlike the traditional child welfare system where I might see a parent for five minutes and then I don't see them for another six months and all sorts of things can happen in between. Um, we do have the Adult Drug Treatment Court follows best practices and the 10 sort of best practices um, that are a national model. The Family Drug Treatment Court is non-criminal and it doesn't quite follow them, but we have our own sort of de uh, best practices. What one of my judges told uh, Justice Jane was that uh, evidence shows that if a judge spends at least three minutes 
with a parent, um, their, um, their outcomes are better. Uh, imagine that, just three minutes. We, we spend three minutes with some, and then some we spend 10 or more. Um, so we try to follow best practices because the outcomes then are, um, are better for parents and families. Um, some of our parents now come, um, the graduates um, of Family to Recruitment Court come back to help other parents. They might end up at, actually I, do, I teach with one of my graduates. She comes along with me and she talks to uh, community groups about supportive services, family drug treatment court, what she thinks she needs to stay healthy and happy and parent her child. Um, so there's a lot of really good outcomes. It's the hardest court that I've ever been in, um, probably because we have that relationship with the, with the parents and their, their families and we know them more and we really want to see them um, uh, have the best outcome possible. We also, as a treatment court family, all of us, we've lost a lot of people in the last several years. When I was doing the court, um, it wasn't as many as now to, due to um, overdoses and fentanyl. Um, the stakes are ever so much higher, but I think the outcomes are ever so much rewarding, so. Thank you, Mary. I'm gonna have the two of you stay here. This is the opportunity for any of you to ask questions of our speakers. A few have left, but most of them are here. And if you have a question, if you push down on that black thing in front of you, just a little knob, uh, we can hear you better. And if not, I'll, I'll try to hear you and repeat the question. Um, Christine's gonna be over there with her mic to travel to any of the speakers you have questions of. But it's your opportunity if you want, if you have questions of someone, um, we'd be happy to answer them. Handheld, handheld for questions too. Oh, okay. If you want. There's another hand. We've got a handheld mic. Now there've got to be questions. Okay, Alex. Uh, so I think there's some things that have been happening during the break with the our school, our alternative school system here, and I was just wondering <laughs> if we could learn a little bit more about that. And and also since I'm a, you know, I'm a college professor, I'm also like a multi-generation college professor. It's kind of weird, but I am. Um, and I and I just, there's so much harm that's been done through higher ed in the ivory tower. And so I'm really interested in the speakers who have managed to negotiate that space of getting that degree, getting that JD, getting that PhD, and having that work towards decolonization and hope and you sort of in the right direction. Like, how does that, how does that happen? But I know those are two big questions, but since somebody else asked anything, I thought I'd just offer them. I'll go with the first question is um, when I was putting that down to, and for us, uh, it's not an alternative classroom. This is the alternative classroom uh, <laughs> from our perspective. And, and what we did was we moved some of what it represents. And what that represents is a, a Grand Medicine Lodge. Remember that in Milwaukee and other areas, the Kickapoo, the Sauk, Potawatomi's, Menominee's, Ho-Chunk people, we had villages all over here. And in the center of each village was a place of healing. And where we are is that is what that is representing as a place of healing and learning. And uh, for those of you that are here, we participated to it about two thirds, not that I was counting. <laughs> Uh, so everyone was to bring a stone and put it in there. And what we're doing in that is the stones to the, by the sand, we're looking at each other, whereas opposed to there, it's all about that speaker. When we're like this, it's about each other for real. Five stones in a row over to the side there, I put them more together because those represent uh, five grandmothers, lifetime appointments when they're uh, listening to us. And sometimes it's not just about issues of difference. It can also be, I'm not healing from something and I need help. And they hold their tobacco and ask that question of them. The two kind of um, uh, wooden bowls there, one contains tobacco and that's how we ask our questions or represent ourselves. Holding it on our left hand, he had a little exercise in that and that represents that truth, that heart line, right? And then the larger stones there represent where our chiefs will sit, um, the heads of our uh, doorways, because it's not just us that's sitting in there, it's also the spirits that help us keep 
our universe together in this place that we are. In the very center, there's stones with a little red piece in there. That represents our fire. And over there to the side, you see three stones. Those are our fire keepers. And the last thing I would say about a rearrangement is I wanted to highlight within that sky realm above, those are seven teachings in those seven white stones sitting on that black stone. And when I was kind of thinking about what was this to be, uh, what I wanted to represent is I would often go back and forth with our grand chief when we'd go on long distances and trying to help people. And we'd talk about this teaching that is about um, this idea of, I say this, to to know in order to heal, you must know the wound. So we needed to be really specific with people when we were headed there or he was headed there. And about and Eddie Benton Benesi was awesome at this. So one of those of the teaching that is there for us is uh, to know the foe, to know the foe in, in conflict, right? To know the foe, but who is the foe? Who, who is it really? Hmm. And so that was one of our, 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 we would really try, and I'm sure those who are litigators and others, who's really the foe in that room? Is it the judge? Is it Because displacement can happen, right? And as a lawyer, you're working with that relationship because you're trying to get to what the client's really talking about. So who is the foe in that room? And of course, we're, we're kind of looking at ourselves and battling that. So, so, so that's what went into this and that Eastern doorway where we enter that's that by choice, and there's a movement to our lodge. And as you can see in the western doorway, there's a black stone there. And, and we don't go out that door. That, that is the doorway where our creator calls us. We don't push our way through the door. And we got a lot of kids doing that. When we talk about restorative justice, for me, my thought of putting that stone there was a thought that when we talk about restorative justice. How do we restore children's lives that have been lost to alcohol, to drugs, to suicide? Can those lives be restored? What do we do and what is our own responsibility in teaching them that we not push their way through? That's all part of it. And in this place, there's healing because there's so much more to what you're seeing there. But that's what that was about, and I had good help from Jason to rearrange. <laughs> to the other question, I'll turn that over to smarter people. <laughs> anybody else want to take a stab at that answer? Or if not, we'll take any other questions? Corinthia, you'll come down with the mic. So. <clears throat> um, where are the resources coming when, when you talk about the courts and and in the community and it all sounds like this has got to be the way it has to be and yet we see the resources drying up and it's just a, a concern how do you see these processes being developed and continued in the future mary do you want to Talk yeah, about I, the funding for those and resources. I, I think the more difficult question is we've tried to expand the resources for years, um, but have not been able to um, do so. I mean, we've got, uh, we've got a lot of judges and others in the system that would like to practice the treatment courts, do more restorative justice, but they're sort of doing it on the side and when they can. and. The treatment courts are sort of, they're, they're, they're not growing as I think they should. The, o the other thing is we're only as good as the resources in the community that we can refer people to, right? And what I always say is it's, it's a late response to something that should have happened before people came into the justice system. Because all we're doing in the treatment courts is getting them the resources that they needed to get in recovery. So alcohol and drug treatment, um, mental health treatment, all of those things. Um, uh, you know, the, it, it's, it's like we're, we're now finally, our voices in a, in a team are loud enough that we can say, look, we need to put them in this program or this program. But there's waiting lists for all those programs. And so I really worry about that. All the programs shut down during COVID 
So we couldn't refer anybody for treatment anywhere. So we just kept meeting with them, right? At least we held on to that piece of it, um, but we lost more people because, because of the crisis going on in our community with these really <clears throat> more virulent, deadly drugs. Um, so I worry about that too, but there's still people who want to fight to try to keep the, the work of the treatment courts going and try to get the resources in the community, but I, I am worried about it. We had a number of people talking about other courts. Um, uh, any of our other speakers like to address the question of how, how is it particularly um, that you are able to use the resources, whatever the resources are, um, to be able to do these kinds of approaches? That's kind of, that's my what? Um, okay. And for tribes that on the side of the sphere is the people gather, ground, and grow, and I, I did that, people gather, ground, and grow. When I talk to tribal people, courts and tribal leaders, we have little resources and have trying to work with what we have over many period of time. And we, we, a lot of things taken away and we have to try to get it back. So the people gather, ground and grow. People, human capital development, organizational development, uh, community infrastructure, environmental support, and economic development. That's all the same thing, the people gather, ground and grow. So my job as a planner was to go and we had to make money. So we developed Grand Canyon West and we made millions of dollars. We're making millions of dollars and, and some other tribes are making millions of dollars of casinos, but we have a different type of money. And we, we're, we should be putting it back into all of what we need. But sometimes we don't have that wherewithal. But we have a mechanism to try to develop our economy for which we can have resources to fund and do what we need to do to heal our people. But there's a lot of times sickness in us, even though we have money, we might not be able to do that. And by the one time I stood up in a lot, uh, it was in Barrow, and this old, older Mabel, I said, well, I said, I, I talked like, I said, we're gonna someday be independent. We won't need any money from the federal government because I, that was my thought. That's, we should be able to do that. We had the Grand Canyon. We could make a lot of money, and we are, we did. Uh, and she stood up and she got mad at me. Don't you ever say that again. And I was, you know, chastising, okay. And then she said, and then she kind of got softer. The federal government promised us for as long as the sun shines and the grass grows and all of those things. And she got mad at me because I, I was trying to be independent about it. But she said, no, they are going to have to give us stuff for taking everything away. And she, Alaska, they took a whole bunch of things and gave them corporations. So there was that kind of thing, and I've, I've, I've always thought about that. I go, while we're, we have to have that, that strength to, to develop everything, and we have the bright people, we have knowledge, we have those young ones that were talking earlier, I mean, those ones, they have, and you have the kids you teach. I mean, we have that possibility, we have that hope. But it's gonna take a long time, but we have that ability to do that. But we also have the promise for the United States for taking and, and all these things that grandparents talk about. You know, the older ones know what your grandma say and it wasn't very nice. And so they have to have all that healing and, 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 and whatnot. And so I get, I get upset when some people, you know, I, I said something that I got in trouble about and then I hear the other federal government saying, we're gonna have to cut this, that, and the other thing. And, but somewhere in there, there's the balance. There's somewhere in there that we have to do what we have to do. We have to. Have, have our partners, our allies, our assistants from everyone else, and to work together on something to restore and heal. And all of our communities have to do that. Not just the, the one thing of native, but we all have communities we come from in all walks of life in this country and all around the world. So I'm just speaking in terms of what tribal people can do. And don't forget, don't get yelled at by Mabel. Mabel. <laughs> don't, don't, they, they have a contract with us. And so the sun is still shining and the grass is still growing. Ron had something to say too. Oh, we've got you. Yeah, I appreciate that. And also, um, uh, two things. One is, you know, I, I, it does, I love, and what brings me hope is thinking about that idea where we have community organizations, we have partnerships, and we need to have those things ahead of time. The problem is, is that we're working with a system that is still set up to hold people back. Those that don't have the power and the money, quite honestly. And so if there is someone that is in need of assistance and support that preemptive measures those strong communities, 
we have to continue to invest in, in making sure that we're creating those opportunities. And right now, when we think about um, the policies and the procedures and the things that are being made, it is being made for us without us. And it really needs to be if it's about us, not without us. And so that is something that within tribal communities that people take for granted because of the fact that, well, like, well, if I have a problem, I know who I can go to. Well, in many tribal communities, if I have a problem, I have no idea who I'm going to. And when I go there, I'm often not listened to. And so how do we continue to build those uh, coalitions and those opportunities? And we have to fix for all communities the broken system that exists right now, in particular, around substance abuse and mental health, in particular, because it's broken. Someone can want help and can't get it. Yep. Someone can want to help their family member and can't do it because they're over 18. And so there's, there's all sorts of parts of it, and that's not exclusive to tribal communities and native communities, but it for sure is at a much larger rate than in other demographics. And so that is something that you know really isn't gonna be just the government figuring out, but we're definitely not letting them off the hook because um, they're behind on several premises or several hundred. Um, and so we do need to make sure that that takes place, but it also has to happen within communities and bringing those coalitions and bringing people in, but it has to be planned in consultation and there is aspects of legislation that requires consultation that still doesn't always take place. And it definitely doesn't take place within urban settings where there's multi, who's representing the tribal community in an urban setting. Um, when their tribal legislation and governments is in a completely different county. Um, so there's a lot of work that has to take place in regards to those processes too. Um, so more problems for you guys to all solve collaboratively. We're here to help yeah, in any way. Good, go. And Ron. Ron had something to say. Well, I mean, I think everybody pretty much answered uh, okay. what I was gonna say. I think we just, tribes just scrap it together. And when we do our resources, we do federal grants, we'll do state grants. If uh, we are told by the state, United States Supreme Court that we can't tax non-Indians, we'll create casinos to generate treasury funds to be able to do this stuff. It's just what we do. And if you create a, a healthcare system uh, where we can get our tribal members signed up for Medicaid, uh, we'll do that and then bill against it to send them to treatment. We'll just do whatever we have to do, as much as we can do. It's not enough, but that's what we do. Any other questions someone has? Jim, you'll come with the mic. Sure. So speaking speaking about communities, um, and it seems like a lot of a, a lot of what is being done is supported by the uh, by the Native American uh, communities. I'm, I'm assuming that would be a correct statement. How do we translate this into the rest of the world, so to say? How do we translate this into <laughs> Milwaukee? How do we translate this into? Uh, Ozaki County into into the rest of Wisconsin and to get the communities to be interested to be get communities to be to be involved and active towards this. So do we have a speaker that wants oh Ron wants to say <laughs> Well I, I think one of the things you should think about is when we've all talked about the systems of our traditional forms of government and then you look at things like state drug courts, it's not us taking from you, it's you taking from us. It's taking the system that is, we just run you through, we try to get as many people through our docket as we can to a system where we surround you with people who care about you, mm -hmm. will talk to you and work with you and come up with something that's individualized to you follow up with you. Those are those traditional systems. And what we're seeing is those peacemaking. You're seeing those in state courts. You're seeing those in state schools. That came from us. So it's, it's not so much that there's a transfer from state courts to us or us to the state courts. It's, it's, it's been a natural evolution as, as we go to conferences like this and we listen to other people and then we feel the resonance of what somebody's doing and think, that's probably going to work for me, and then you try it. Because I steal things, I'll steal things from a state court if I think it's going to work in my court. Um, and I know the state courts have stolen peacemaking from us. Not stolen, it's the wrong word. <laughs> Borrowed. Uh, but those Copied. are, those, Learned. you'll say it. <laughs> but, that's, that? those are, those, but, but many of Plagiarized. the restorative, 
in many of the restorative things you look at, when you look and read about the indigenous forms of justice, those were the same things that you're now seeing in the state court because what happens in state courts doesn't work very well. And then when you do it in a way that we've always done it and study the outcomes, your outcomes are better, which is something that we knew because we've been doing it for thousands of years without a bunch of money in jails and things. We had to solve our problems in our communities because no, they weren't going anywhere. It's not, they weren't, you know, we could banish them, but, you know, family's family. We got to deal with them. And so I think that that natural flow is, but, but a lot of restorative justice, you can find its roots deep in indigenous justice. That's why we're having this conference. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anybody else? Other questions? Here's another question. Um, just a quick question for Mr. Dropic. <laughs> Can you just explain a little bit about the Repairing Together program that Indian Community School is a part of? Yeah, I, that's actually a good one. I'd love to talk about that. And I was worried it was going to be a tough question. Um, but no, in general, when you talk about you know community and how do you expand community and how do we continue to engage, uh, so the Indian Community School, and it wasn't our program, we just we discovered it, stole it. Um, we joined in partnership with it. It actually came through um, the work of uh, Elsing Crawford in particular, the Milwaukee Jewish Day School, um, and had done some work with wanting to bring people together to really uh, raise empathy and to raise collective understanding within populations that often might not necessarily find themselves in the same space, in the same time, um, and together. And so she had created uh, Repairing Together to bring groups together. So it was the Milwaukee Jewish Day School, Bruce Guadalupe, um, and it was at that time, it was a different school, but it was a school that focused in on within African American students. And then we came in afterwards too, and so now the partners are Milwaukee Jewish Day School, Bruce Guadalupe, Martin Luther King Jr. School, and then our school. And the students come together, K-4 through 8th grade, at different times and different programs in different ways to build community, to get to know one another, to share um, different experiences and practices and ways of being and, and explain it. Not just have it in a book, but to experience it, to, to be together in that journey. So that way, hopefully, uh, we're building a community that is a little bit more knowledgeable, not just of ourselves, which is really important. Got to be able to understand ourselves. But one of the appeals of that program for me was like, yep, we can talk about Native um, issues and, and we can talk about American Indian identity. We can talk about those things. But I also, our students are going to be around other people. They're going to be around other cultures. They're going to be around other experiences. And if we can do our best to try to help prepare them for what those other philosophies or ways of being or customs and traditions are, they one, hopefully will have a really good understanding and appreciation for their own, but also then for others and other people's ways of being so that when there is conflict, when there is challenges or when there is a lack of understanding, they feel comfortable enough to share it with one another. And so that, that group is um, you know, meeting out throughout the course of the school year, doing lots of different activities. And our goal next year is to get some of our families together, get those families from those schools to come and engage in programming together so that they, that community doesn't just exist in that classroom, in that program, it exists in all of our spaces. And so, yeah, that's a really good point. Thanks for and Let me just jump in that some people have asked about, do you want to tell them where your school is? People were interested, and I've asked permission um, from Jason that he's willing to share his email, and I'll put it on Christine, wherever she is, um, that if you're interested in that, Christine will have his email, and he's willing to share it if you want to do a tour sometime or have some interest in the school. Um, but do you want to tell them where it is? Adrian's address is. <laughs> <laughs> We are, we are located in Franklin, Wisconsin. We're right off St. Martin's Road in Loomis. Uh, please don't just drop by. <laughs> please email me. Um, we do run a school, and so we would like to, to not have you get head off by Lens is one of our security guards. We have some, some relatives here from the color guard that you know will let you know he'll keep an eye on you too. Uh, but we're in Franklin, Wisconsin, right off that area. Yeah, email me though is fine, and we can definitely work on some opportunities to, to check out the space and gather. We do um, like to share the good work that is done and I think that was it. Was that the question? Franklin, yeah, Franklin. Thank you. Bring a shovel if it's snowing. <laughs> well, we probably have time for one more question if anybody has one. If not, all right. Um,
think about how you might make ceremony in your everyday life. I used to, well, I taught a class, and I was talking to the other Stanford graduate here. That she's, she's not too much, she's my almost my same class. Uh, and I told the students, think of this, and maybe there are four parts of ceremony. And the first part is cleansing. And then maybe the second part could be organizing or putting in place. And then the third part is remembering or reacquainting, going back and going through maybe creation story to now. And then the fourth part is putting your heart and mind towards creation, creator, asking God or doing the prayer part. And so every day you wake up and you take, well, most people take a shower. You, you wash your dishes. You wash your clothes. You wash the dishes, you put them away. You wash your clothes, you put them away. You wash yourself, you put clothes on you. You, you clean your house, you put things in order. All of those things are part of ceremony. And if people could just take their daily lives and then put it into their work, into their efforts, and today there's a lot of many ceremonies going on, the singing, the, 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 the rocks, the, the, the different kind of talking, and the, the reverence. It's all ceremony, and it's a special time. It's, it's a reverent time to stop and think where you are as a human being right now with all these different people, and then what you're looking for, the vision, the same thing, the past, the present, the possibility. If you kind of put all of that together and you think of how you could learn and move forward and do all this kind of work in your, in your own heart, with your own self, with your family, which, like I told you, I have the challenge of that, then maybe all of this can translate into a bigger society, bigger people, more people. And, and we make every day a special day and just by waking up and doing those very same things. And then some of you have a very ritualistic way of doing it. Sunday, so, so Thursday the cleaning, Friday the putting away, Saturday the remembering, going back and writing letters to someone, and Sunday go to church. You know, you could put every day somehow in, in a sequence of ceremony, and then that would hopefully restore, restore ourselves, restore communities, and restore peoples back to something we were, are, are still, we just don't have that presence. Thank you. I'm with you. Well, those are great words for us. Well, I, wanna, I want to end by thanking a number of people. I want to begin band with the Chief Justice who traveled uh, and spent two days with us, and Chief Judge Mary Trujiano. Um, I want to thank all our presenters, those are here and not here. Um, and I'm going to ask for one more round of applause because they have enriched us today. Um, I, I want to thank Dean Kearney. I don't know if he's still back there. But uh, Dean Kearney has sat through most of this. Yeah, he's back there. Um, and, uh, you know, because of Joe, this program exists. If Joe had not been supportive way back when, when I went to see him about trying to do restorative justice, in all the years as a faculty member, being able to put together the initiative we had for a number of years is really because we had incredible support from the dean. And so um, I am very grateful to him. I also want to take a moment thank the IT people, wherever they are. They have been fabulous. And they were the people that were ready to stream the whole thing, all the presenters from their hotel rooms this morning, if they closed the university. So we were going to be completely online. And people were, were going to you know, connect. And the IT team was ready to handle it. So they've been here with the mics and, and the streaming. And I do want to mention again, this will all be on the website that if you want to watch parts of it again or you want to show it for education purposes, you're free to do that. Um, it's one of the benefits, I think, of, of these conferences is that it can continue on for others. I know there are segments from a lot of speakers today that my students are going to see um, in class because there were so many wise, wonderful comments. Um, I, I want to thank the, the Marquette team. I mean, it's, it's Christine Walensky vogel and, and her team, who have put this all together and worked very hard to make this happen. And uh, to end this, of course, Sue Andrew and, and the Andrew, the, I know she's saying no, but I'm going to recognize them <laughs> because this wouldn't have happened either.
So I want to thank you all, particularly for coming, spending the time, being brave enough to face the snow this morning. I want to thank all the people that are watching us streaming and uh, watch. You'll hear more from us, and uh, we look forward to um, continuing to serve the community in many ways. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, we're now we're now going to enter into the closing flag and drum ceremony. So once again, as we begin our responsibilities this morning, our remaining responsibility is to give a good respect again to our institution, our country, uh, the nations we belong to. So if anyone please will stand. And in our final thoughts of thinking, representing that good Anishinaabe and also ways of our longhouse, the words of the four principles in our life because we have different values and different nations that are represented here and within that longhouse we talk about knowledge the knowledge of self the knowledge of a lifetime pursuit we talk about wisdom that comes from the pursuit of that knowledge and in the united nation we also talk about two more values which is love of self allows for love of others and certainly with restoring for of justice here and empathy and empathy that begins with yourself and then it can go to others so again thank you for the time thank you dean we're in the back much appreciated and we're going to bring our colors out now is it truth before peace or peace before truth we shouldn't argue with it little priest taking our colors out What a good round for our singers, a little priest. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody.
see you again. Yeah.